that. We'll call the order of the um, September 20th um, HLRB meeting. Uh, please call the roll. Okay. Mr. John Aiken. Here. Here. Mr. Amari Davis. Here. Robert Dudka. Alex Foster. Here. Carmela Ham. Gray Handley. Gerald Laporte is excused. Joan Lawrence is excused. Rebecca Meyer. Here. Katie Myers. Here. Mark Turnbull. Andrew Wenchel. Here. And Dick Woodruff is excused. Okay, so we do have an in-person forum. Great. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Everybody online, but in general, but especially the five that are here, four that are here. Start from me. Um, any event, um, I'll just uh, do the explanation of, um, of, of today's um, hearing procedures. So again, welcome to this uh, meeting again. And so effective September 1st, 2022, new state regulation now requires county board appointed commissions, including the HRB, to have in person forums to conduct business. HRB hearings are provided in hybrid environment, both in person and street online. Members of the public may attend and participate either virtually or in person. Members of the board, members of the, sorry, members of the board and members of the public during this evening. Tonight, some meeting is available to stream via the county website via the Teams link. There's also a dial and phone option for those who wish to use it. If board members or the nor speakers lose connectivity, uh, please please call back by phone. Please keep your device muted and video turned off until you are called on to speak. Public speakers not sponsoring items on the agenda, pre-registration to speak online today's hearing was required. Speaker slips are available at the front of the room for those of person speakers who wish to call who wish to speak. I'll call you to speak after presentation of the agenda item. The meeting in chat is active for participants who need technical assistance only. It should not be used for discussion, public comment, questions about the agenda item, or request for more information. All public comments must be shared verbally for the record during the signed public testimony period. All voting will be done by call the roll. And lastly, today's public today's meeting is a public forum. And, and today's meeting will be recorded and posted on the county's website. All information associated with today's meeting, whether written, spoken, is subject to the Freedom of Information Act requirements. And uh, with that, we can um, review and approve the June and July minutes. Um, I guess we'll first just do the June minutes separately, then July minutes separately. So, are there any questions or comments about the, about the minutes? Any? Uh, so, hearing on, can I get a motion to approve the, the June minutes? I wasn't present, so I can't. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm checking if I was. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah. I think I should, yeah, I'll, I'll move to approve the June minutes. Okay. Um, I'll second the motion. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so please respond yes if you support the June minutes. Mr. Aiken? Abstain. Okay. Mr. Davis? Yes. Ms. Foster? I wasn't present. Abstain. Abstain. Ms. Meyer? Abstain. Ms. Myers? Yes. Mr. Wenschel? Yes. Okay. That does pass. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Moving on to July. All right, it's July minutes. I'll right. make the motion on that one. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, I'll second the just to... Okay. Mr. Aiken? Yes. Yes. Mr. Davis? Yes. Ms. Foster? Abstain. Ms. Meyer? Yes. Ms. Myers? Yes. Mr. Wetchell? Yes. Okay. Great. Okay. Great. All right. Thank you. And um, are there any um, questions? This next are the ministry of CUAs. Assuming there are no questions about those, um, so we'll move on to our move on to our first item. First item, the, um, which is the uh, 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 sorry, the uh, Barcroft Apartment Section Four renovation. All right. All right. So this is an informational item: Barcroft Apartment Section Four renovations. We have. The applicants here, some very familiar, several mm -hmm. online. And thank you. And there are members also of their team online. 
So I'm going to go ahead and give a brief overview of uh, my staff report um, concerning the project, and then I'll turn it over to our applicants who will give much more detail. So the HLRB is being asked to review and provide input to the renovation of the Barcroft Apartments. You all reviewed Section 3 over the summer, and now we're asking to review renovations for Section 4. Barcroft is identified in the Columbia Pike Neighborhoods Area Plan. Barcroft is one of three multifamily residential areas identified as a conservation area in the neighborhood form based code. And it is um, the case of Barcroft, the applicant is required to follow specific standards of the conservation areas as identified in part seven of the conservation area standards. And those standards also require the applicants to meet with the HLRB a minimum of two times before the project can be considered by the county board. So we'll hear from them tonight and we'll figure out if we're going to hear from them in October. <laughs> So the proposal, I'm going to go through a long list. Um, the proposal is to renovate Section 4, and it involves the following repairs to the exterior masonry, repointing of deteriorated mode, um, mortar, um, and matching these to the existing size and shape and color and texture of what's there, gentle cleaning and washing of all the existing brick and concrete facades, removal and replacement of steel sash basement windows with vinyl windows that match the original configuration, removal and replacement of existing mechanical systems, including existing through wall mechanical system openings and patching of exterior walls to match the surrounding brick, removal and replacement of non-original light fixtures with new compatible fixtures, replacement of gutters and downspouts in kind, placement of asphalt roofs with new asphalt, repair and painting existing metal railings, repair and painting existing non-original shutters, repair and painting corroded metal lintels, addition of ADA compliant ramps and entrances with fiberglass doors at rear elevation of building 33, addition of new entry canopies above entrances to meet Virginia housing requirements, addition of vinyl or aluminum cladding on existing wood trim for Virginia housing requirements, addition of new penetrations on rear elevations for bathroom exhaust, dryer and HVAC vents, and then new construction of a new trash enclosure north of building 33. The Design Review Committee um, reviewed the project at their September 6th hybrid meeting. Um, there was some specific discussion concerning the proposed rear handrail um, behind Building 33 um, for the ADA ramp, and there was recommendations to kind of minimize the horizontality of the, or no, to create more of a horizontality approach to the railings instead of multiple vertical bars and just to kind of soften the appearance. And then there was just other discussions kind of clarifying the treatments that were going to be done with the scope of the um, renovation. So now I'll go into my recommendations. So staff does not have any issues with that long, long scope that I just explained. Um, majority of those follow guidance of both part seven of the conservation area standards, as well as the Secretary of Interior standards for rehab of historic properties, specifically standards one, two and nine. Although most of these do fall under um, the recommendations with the Secretary of Interior Standards, there are a couple that are not consistent. That's the removal and replacement of the steel stash basement windows with vinyl basement windows, new penetrations for vents on the rear elevations, the use of vinyl or aluminum cladding on existing wood trim as per Virginia housing requirements, and the installation of canopies above all entrances to meet Virginia housing requirements. Staff considers the proposed replacement of the steel stash basement windows with vinyl as a minor change to the historic material. And all the original windows in section four have already been replaced except those basement story windows. Although the steel stash basement windows are original, they are not considered character defining features to Barcroft. Concerning the new penetrations for the vents and rear, staff sees this as necessary so that the historic buildings can adapt to the needs of its current and future residents without negatively affecting character defining features. And again, these penetrations are minimal. Staff agrees that the cladding of the existing wood trim materials and the installation of entry canopies as per the Virginia housing requirements. Likewise, are minimal changes to these character defining features. And we've asked the applicant to, to continue to work with Virginia housing to see if there might be a possibility of waiving these. Um, and I know that those conversations are ongoing. We might get an update tonight, but if not, then maybe we'll get an update next month. Um, also, um, in addition, the installation of the canopies, you know, these are going to occur on the rear elevation of thir building 33, um, and we're going to kind of work with them to make sure that those are mounted into the mortar joints and not like the actual bricks, so we'll kind of minimize the impact to this sort of material. But again, most of these standards 
to follow standards six and ten of the Secretary of Interior standards for rehab. Um, and again, we're going to continue working with them um, and Virginia Department of Historic Resources to see if there's a chance of getting waivers for some of these items. But as kind of what was happening with Section three, we need to present it this way just in case there's a chance that they don't get those waivers. We need to see if the HLF is comfortable with those or not. But again, this is an informational item. So it's kind of like we're getting guidance, we're reviewing it, see what we can do to tweak it. If not, um, this would be included in uh, kind of a general summary um, within the um, use permit uh, board report that staff would provide about how the HLRB considered the project. And then there is some mention about their tree removal and the replacement plan. Um, there are eight live trees that are proposed for removal and one live invasive tree. Um, these trees have to be removed. There's more than that, but these are trees that are the ones that we're highlighting the most, but they have to be removed because it's where the pedestrian circulation is going to be, as well as um, accommodating the ADA parking spaces. And um, we're also seeing that, you know, although these trees have to be removed, they are going to meet their replacement requirements, which means that there will be 22 new trees that will be planted at site to mitigate um, that change. And we just kind of ask that the applicant continue working with urban forestry about what's going on with their tree plan. That's my part. Sorry that took longer than thought. Um, please go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Lauren. Um, and I know I've met with you all in the past couple of months, but for the record, my name is Lauren Riley. I'm with Walsh Pollution. We represent the applicant team for these uh, use permit renovation phases and uh, associated use permits for Barcroft. And in the room with me tonight is David Woody, which I Lynch. And then we've got a number of our design team um, and applicant team members online as well. Um, we have Brett Ward with Jire Lynch, and then from the architects, sponsoring your design architects, we have Antoine Lindron and Eli Perez. I think Murdad Ruzan might be here as well. Um, and we also have um, Jeff Krebs from our civil engineering team, and then members from Traceries as well, Sarah Monish and Laura Hughes, rounding out the team. So. Just to provide a little more context about the scope of this application, uh, we recently filed the form based code special um, use permit application in August, triggering that process very similar to the one we just went through last summer. We're waiting on comments from staff um, in the meantime meeting with DRC and HLRB to discuss the scope of these renovations. As Lauren mentioned, uh, the form based code requires applicants to meet with HALRB at least twice to discuss any uh, proposed projects in the conservation area. Greg, if you could go to the, to the next slide. There we go. Uh, just to reorient everyone where we are in the county, Columbia Pike, uh, and we're on the west side of the Columbia Pike corridor. The entire Barcroft site there is outlined in blue. As Lauren mentioned in her staff report, um, as we discussed before, uh, Jire Lynch acquired this site uh, with assistance from the county and Amazon funding uh, a few years ago while we're working on the, uh, the total master finance and development plan for what the entire you know, development for the entire site will be. In the meantime, we want to start working on these areas where we know there will not be any redevelopment um, areas where we can Go ahead and start improving the existing conditions for some of these residents. So this is um, this is the impetus behind the first renovation phase and now the second renovation phase. And you'll see most of that is um, shaded in that lighter color. That's all within the neighborhood's form-based code. A small, very small portion on the west side is located within the commercial form-based code. Go to the next slide. Here's a regulating plan map of the form-based code delineating where the conservation area and adjacent conservation area um, locations are. That light green color is the conservation area, which is intended not only to preserve uh, buildings with regard to their historic nature, but also to preserve their housing affordability as well. And those areas in blue are slated for redevelopment areas next to conservation areas um, anticipated to be redeveloped. And so while some of this plan might change with the future, uh, the upcoming master finance and development plan, there are a couple areas in here where we know will be 
retained, similar to the phase one renovation. Greg, go to the next slide. And so, sorry for switching orientations on you. Columbia Pike is now plan left, north is, is plan left. And you may recall uh, it, over the summer, we had talked about the different phases that Barcroft was developed in. There's 50 plus buildings here. They were developed in the 1940s and 50s in two phases. That kind of area, that area outlined in blue, there was phase one developed mainly in the 1940s. That other area to the top of the page outlined in red is phase two developed in the later 40s and early 50s. And you'll see the area shaded in gray there, those pink buildings 22 through 26. Those are um, those are the buildings we reviewed in renovation phase one that was approved in July of this year by the county board and that included exterior and interior renovation site work landscaping and building additions and, and you'll see on the right. These are the three buildings that are now within the scope of this renovation phase two use permit it's three buildings 32 33 and 34. They're within what we would call section four of Barcroft and you can see these buildings are all color coded um, and, and put into sections based on when they were were developed. So these were within part of section four and there's about 77 units existing there today and they're all two bedroom units. So looking at the site and opportunities here, um, the scope of, of renovation is going to be a little bit smaller than what you saw in section one. It'll be very similar in terms of the exterior uh, renovations which we'll go through but there will not be any uh, building additions here though we have identified a pretty rare opportunity to um, to add on ADA accessible units uh, convert existing two bedroom units to ADA accessible units on the back of building 33 so we'll walk through some of the, um, the improvements associated with that and then similar um, site work uh, that was that was done on phase one we'll do it here in the next slide then here's an aerial image of, of where those buildings are. You can see in context the entire bar crop site there. It's kind of on that tail end. No redevelopment anticipated in this area. It kind of abuts that, that other residential community there to the back. Next slide. Here for some context of, of the buildings, uh, photos as they exist today. Um, you can see here building 32 fronting South Four Mile Run Drive. See the interior courtyard and some of the more um, ornate entry surrounds there. Next slide. Moving south, so this photo is building 33. Um, and I'll note here too, unlike phase one, some of these buildings have been painted, the brick has been painted this yellow color. Um, and when we go through the scope of renovations, we'll note where we'll be painting to match existing. Next slide. And then the last building uh, at the very end of the tail there, building 34. So, so we see photos of that one, especially grade. You can see it's dropping down toward toward the south there. Next slide. To summarize the scope, uh, the exterior renovations are almost identical to what you've reviewed in phase one. Lauren went through the list of them. It's clean, cleaning up the brick, repointing the brick where needed, replacing the existing asphalt roofs with new asphalt roofs, upgrading, uh, replacing some of these fixtures. And then similar to, to phase one um, with the interior, we'll be removing those older heating and air systems that require boilers and PTAC units, and upgrading those with some newer, more modern HVAC equipment. And so because of that, we'll be removing some of those um, exterior vents there, you can see where the numbers three and four are. We'll be removing those and patching with brick. That will be painted to match the existing in the case where it's painted um, or not to match the, the original brick there uh, on the front elevations. And then on the rear elevations, we'll need to have some new penetrations to accommodate that new equipment similar to the to the previous approval. All, all new rear penetrations will be on the rear elevations of these buildings. Next slide. And then as, as Lauren mentioned, we'll be replacing these basement, uh, these metal basement windows with vinyl to match existing, similar to phase one. All of the uh, windows on this building, the original wood had already been replaced with vinyl windows. And so we'll be replacing these basement windows to match existing ones. And then 
you go back one, Greg? Thanks. And then, um, as I mentioned, some new rear penetrations on those buildings. And then Lauren went through um, so, some of the changes that we need to make to meet the Virginia housing uh, design, construction design standards as we will again be seeking uh, affordable housing funds from, from Virginia housing. We have to meet their construction standards for uh, which include canopies above residential entries, aluminum or vinyl cladding, uh, exterior wood, and then also uh, new to this application, fiberglass doors for those new entrances. So there'll be um, there'll be four units that we're converting to ADA accessible units. So that's um, four new rear doors that will um, rear openings that we'll have to add to the back of building 33. And you'll see that where that is in a second. And we'll be putting um, fiberglass doors in as required by Virginia Housing. Though, unlike the canopies and um, the aluminum cladding, probably will not be requesting a waiver for this because of uh, the uh, the new. These would be brand new entries into into these units, um, and the fiberglass doors required for durability there uh, for for those four accessible units. We go to the next slide. So here you can start to see how these improvements lay out on the site. This is a close up view of building 33, which is that middle building of the three. Um, and you can see some of the site improvements that that we're making. As, as Lauren mentioned, we'll have to take down some of the existing trees to accommodate the ramping up to those accessible units, um, as well as because of uh, utility work associated with some of the site improvements around these buildings. And in the parking area, we'll be restriping that parking to accommodate four new accessible parking spaces and then creating a pathway from the parking um, area to those four ADA units in the back where you can see um, kind of at the top of uh, at the top of the plan there we'll also be moving the uh, the dumpster from the north part of the site over here to closer to the accessible units so that it's easier for those folks to um, to take out their trash and it's close to their parking space as well, which would be convenient. Uh, we'll also be adding a tr wooden tr trash enclosure to that to that area as well. And I think that's all to cover here. And I'll note that there are no guidelines in the form-based code for these kind of accessory structures for this trash enclosure. Um, and so this is um, what we've come up with to appropriately screen that that dumpster area from from the parking lot there. And then with that, I'm going to hand it off now to the architects to walk you through the elevations and the design of some of these improvements. And I'll note that as an update from our DRC meeting a couple of weeks ago, we did look into a couple of options for those railings, as Mr. Winchell suggested, and we've got options for you all to look at tonight. And um, we'd like your your feedback on that when we get around to it. We're done. Uh, good, evening. good evening. Yeah, yeah. my name my is Merdot Fruzon with Bonsra Hairstyle Architects. Um, as Ms. Riley explained, can you hear me? Yes, thanks, yes. thanks for not yeah. asking Greg to, to go for one more slide. Yeah. There we go. Uh, as Ms. Riley explained, uh, we designed four type of units in the building 33 of the section four of Barcroft. And uh, uh, we designed new uh, openings and uh, also uh, one new ramp and one sloped uh, walkway for uh, to access these uh, four units. As you see on this slide, uh, the type A units are in the address 4215 and 4217 of the Section four of Barcroft and uh, Building Thirty Three, and uh, well, on the left side you see an ADA ramp, uh, one over twelve, a bit uh, railing, uh, and then on the right side you see the the the, the sloped uh, walkway because uh, it the slope doesn't reach the one over twelve; it's just five percent, so it doesn't need any guardrail, unlike the other ramp actually. So uh, we suggested two 
a different uh, design for the railing. Uh, one is, as you see here, is with an uh, infield mesh panel uh, on the left side, as you see. And, uh, and the other on the next slide, if we can. And sorry, sorry to interrupt for that. It's, Eleanor, it's kind of hard to see on this screen the difference in the detail. We do have some slides coming up that will show precedent images for you. So yes, don't yes. worry, it's a little bit more. Uh, we, we will correct. correct. We have uh, perspectives uh, and we can show it better in the next slides. So this is the first approach, the first, uh, the option one for the railing with the infield mesh panel. And in the next slide, uh, we have a more horizontal design uh, for the railing. Uh, next slide, please. And then here oh, the, sorry. the the perspectives. Is it, is it not changing? We, we can see it. We're not. No, uh, the perspectives. I wanted to show the perspectives, basically. Oh, OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Greg, yeah. can you go back to back right. two slides, I think? Correct. Yeah, yeah, so this is the option slides. one, as you see yeah. the infield mesh panels on, on the ground. And uh, the second one is the horizontal railings. Or, so this is an L-shaped uh, ramp uh, with a landing in the middle. And uh, the two units uh, in the address uh, 4215 have a common landing, common entrance land. Uh, next slide, please. So here we have uh, the examples of these two different uh, op options uh, with the infield uh, uh, mesh panel and then also the horizontal elements. Uh, and then we also have on the right side, as you see, even with the with the very light cables that uh, gives a very uh, light uh, appearance to 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 the railing. Next slide, please. So uh, these pictures are taken from the. Uh, uh, these are existing doors uh, in the building uh, 30. Uh, I, I think it's the, the building 32. Uh, so we're going to use the same type of uh, the same design and pattern for the vinyl doors in the new uh, type A units or accessible units in the four accessible units that we just showed you. So the same that they have like a nine uh, a light uh, with uh, two uh, two panels uh, at, at in the in at the below of, of the of the doors. Uh, again, this is just an example of the door and uh, disregard the, the window next to it. We, we just show the, uh, the the design of the existing doors in this uh, in this complex. Next slide, please. Yeah, again, as a as a part of our scope here, we are changing the uh, the exterior lights and uh, the we are the uh, on the right side, you see the number of lights in the building 32, 33, 34. The light is very similar to the existing, which we try to use to, to, to select the same type of design and size to match uh, what is the existing in, this, uh, in these buildings. Next slide. Yeah, uh, well, th this uh, explains the, the, the windows. Uh, all the windows uh, to be replaced uh, in the in the basement uh, will be uh, vinyl single hung, uh, very performant uh, U value and uh, SHGC uh, with uh, dual pane insulated glass and uh, and then they are uh, simulated divided light actually. Next slide. 
So as uh, Ms. Riley explained, all the wood uh, trims, uh, fascia, uh, columns, whatever it is on the exterior side uh, needs to be uh, cladded based on the VHDA minimum design and construction uh, requirements. But uh, we know that the exceptions may be considered for historic buildings. Next slide. Again, as a VHDA uh, minimum design and construction requirements, we need to have uh, canopies uh, for the entrances. So we uh, designed two different types of canopy for the first phase uh, of this uh, complex of these projects, section three and four, and we are doing, we are suggesting again the same uh, type of canopies. Uh, one is uh, more modern, as you see on the left side of this axonometric uh, perspective, uh, with tiebacks, and the other, they are more classical and traditional design with a, a triangular structure. Uh, on the right side. Uh, so the, the canopies need to be uh, like 30 inches of overhang uh, in front of the door and they have to be at uh, at least 12 inches on each side of the door, uh, the entrance door. Next slide. So here you see the, uh, the first option, which is uh, as I said, more modern design and approach with the tie back to the to the exterior brick wall. And then on the right side, you can see a perspective of this same uh, design. And uh, the next slide shows the uh, traditional approach of uh, uh, of this canopy. Again, the, the size is the same, just the design is different. And this second option was the one that Design Review Committee and HEI letter B um, preferred in the previous iteration that we wanted to show you both options again. Yes, correct. Yes. And the uh, next uh, slide shows. Uh, is it the same that I have here? Yeah, these um, are the, the rear entrance. Uh, yeah, these are the rear entrance. I'm sorry, it's small. I cannot see it well. So uh, yeah, these are the rear entrance, and we just have that uh, second option for the rear entrances. Uh, I need to mention that uh, the number of uh, uh, canopies also is marked here. The building 32 will get uh, six canopies, building 33, two canopies, and building 44, 34, only one canopy. In the back entrance. That's thanks, it. thanks for it on. And then here's oh. a, an overview of our, our application summary that we've submitted. Again, uh, we've submitted that uh, for base code use permit application. Requested a couple modifications. One of those uh, is similar to the previous application uh, related to setbacks and parking to permit these existing buildings to remain the same. And the other, uh, we have two sets of modifications to the conservation area standards. You know, one is for those window replacements, new um, penetrations to the rear elevations, as well as the those new ADA units and doors. And in that second group of conservation area standard modifications are those which we're including in this application, but we do plan on requesting a waiver for, which is the um, clad, vinyl or aluminum cladding of wood trim, as well as the um, the entrance canopies. So those we will still pursue waivers for, though we haven't. Um, yet heard back from Virginia Housing on the phase one, so we don't have any updates yet for you today, but we'll continue to, to work on that. And we've included those in, in this application. So that's that concludes our presentation. We appreciate your, your time this evening. Welcome your feedback and especially suggestions on those two railing options. Thank you. Yes. For the board, any um, questions or comments? Any thoughts from Andy, I guess, about the railings? Or? Well, having worked at the point in my architectural career uh, for Paralyzed Veterans of America, uh, people with disabilities appreciate ramps, and landings, and 
and so forth. But um, what they don't appreciate is calling attention to them going up and down a ramp or, or that excess, which tends to magnify their uh, disability. If you will. So they, they don't like to be made a spectacle of, if you will, uh, and particularly those that are hand propelled or hands propelled uh, wheelchairs uh, you're quite athletic it's it's a real issue um, so I think the lightest approach is the preferred approach there are obviously uh, yeah Greg could you go back to the uh, yeah. precedent images for the railings thank you uh, forward two more yeah there you go I, I think the far right corner, uh, bottom corner, is uh, I would prefer or the far right upper corner would be a, a secondary option. I, I don't think there's any real issue with uh, this being uh, required. As a guardrail, it's really a handrail, and that's all that's required because the landings are not that high above the grid. That's my comments. Thank you. So, question on that Do you need the full guardrail, or can you just have a handrail? So, Jeff, I think you might be able to opine on the different, the two different slopes that we have and the need for the railing on the um, on, on the one that has the 8% slope and how high that needs to be. Can you jump in on that? Yeah, I don't have the, you know, the exact grades, but when we calculate it out, of course, anytime we get above the 30 inch change in elevation from the top of the, you know, the ramp surface to the adjacent grade, we'll need to have the guardrail in addition to the handrail. So, you know, working with the conditions as we have them right now, we believe that there's a little, there's a portion of that ramp that would need the guardrail as well. Um, not the entirety, but the the sort of top part where uh, it is highest relative to the adjacent grade. The ramp on the right side of the page is really more of a sloping sidewalk, so it doesn't need any treatment at all. So um, we will, you know, continue to evaluate, and of course, we would want to do the least obtrusive thing we can, uh, and so. Um, if we can reduce that, of course we will, um, and we'll just continue to investigate it. But it, it is possible that as we approach that, or you know, move beyond that 30-inch differential, that we would need to uh, employ a guardrail as well. Well, yeah, I would just say do as little as possible. I think the right. the mesh and the cables to me look super modern. Um, so I like just kind of the steel um, slats. Um, the best. <clears throat> Absolutely, I agree with what you're saying. I think that the uh, less obtrusive visual one is definitely better. I like the horizontality, especially of the, the kind of slats, especially that flat one. I know it's a little bit more contemporary, but it kind of disappears a little bit. I have a little bit of a concern with the cables just in terms of maintenance and, and how that lives. Um, Honestly, I'm not really drawn to the cables and exterior application personally. But um, again, I like the horizontality. I know the DRC has already gone over the canopies as well. And just for information, um, I do like the contemporary one. I don't think it looks overly contemporary. I think it really does help to emphasize that opening that's there. And I would almost wonder if on the second application, it would make sense to evaluate lowering that canopy a little bit it kind of catches right on top of that arch it's kind of an awkward moment um mm -hmm. there it kind of sits on top of that plinth and it feels mm -hmm. very grounded and it doesn't take away from the structure but on the other application the canopy sits on top of an arch i've never it's just not intuitive um do you mean on the rear the elevation? rear entrance it's really you know, awkward forward a couple groups. um there. right there it's just okay Something feels wrong about that. It doesn't you respect cover the, the right. I mean, just to make it horizontal and just kind of let it be what it wants to be. Um, and again, I think in that application, the first slightly we're calling it more contemporary, but I think it also just kind of disappears. It doesn't make a new statement, um, and I think that's okay for a historic building. 
Yeah, I agree with that. I um, also kind of prefer the contemporary um, canopy, and even on the one with the more um, monolithic and decorative trim, I wonder too if that one, um, if there's an opportunity to lower it and to integrate it somehow within it to where it doesn't detract from the trim, but it also doesn't feel like it's 12 feet off the ground. Right. Um, and then for the guardrail, I prefer the cable. I think that it will disappear. And I wonder if there's a way that um, the handrail and guardrail can be designed to have the same language and the same style um, to where when you only need the handrail, you have that metal post and it reads the same. And then for the guardrail, introducing the the cable to to meet the requirements, but also have it be the least intrusive. But I think it's okay to have the historic building and then contemporary elements that clearly delineate that, hey, we're not trying to replicate what was never here. Mm -hmm. So your um, elevation to mm -hmm. new, newer um, elements there. Merdan, could we um, want to call on you real quick to get a little more information about the distance between the canopy and on the rear elevations between the canopy and the that kind of archway cur currently and you know, what your thoughts are, if you have any initial thoughts on the ability to, to lower yeah. that. Yeah, the design intention was to place the canopy above that trim to respect it actually. We didn't want to lower it in a way that we do not see that trim around it. You know, that that was uh, we wanted to have both of them to coexist and not to, you know, hide one the other. You see, that was the intention. And since these these are beautiful decorative elements around the door. So I, I mean, again, we as architects, we thought that it's better to um, even though you're right, the canopy like 12 feet above the door, above the ground is uh, somehow um, particular. However, the main intention was to respect that decorative element, if it makes sense. And I think on the front entrances with the canopies, it makes sense to have it where it's located now on the back, kind of thinking about these newer elements that we're introducing to the rear of the buildings and the canopies. We can study the ability um, to lower it, like you, like you said. We can take a look at that and see what it might look like, um, and if it's something that we could accommodate within the ADA requirements and Virginia housing requirements as well. For the doors, I think on the front entry, um, I think I'm looking at the last page in the PowerPoint that was uploaded. Um, where you do have that decorative entrance trim and the double doors, is the intent to go back with something similar there? Are you looking at the the HALRB submission packet or yes. the front entrances? I believe so. It's the last slide. Let's see. Um, are you speaking about the back uh, entrance? The, the front. The front. It's on uh, the exterior lighting fixtures page as well. I know we looked at what the fiberglass door would be for the unit entries. I'm just wondering what we're doing with the with the front door. And with the existing ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, no, I believe those were just uh, repairing and repainting the front existing front doors. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. Uh, I mean the. The, the front door are to be uh, replaced, if I don't mistake. Uh, Anton, can you can you take this? The the front doors will be uh, will be repaired. Oh, repaired. Okay. Yes. yes. The the on, the only thing that um, might happen is is a new hardware to match the existing hardware, uh, because some of the hardware and plates have been, um, you know, used quite a bit uh, throughout the years. Um, so they might be in need to change those, but we want to keep those doors exactly the way they are. Same same for the trims. Okay, great. 
Can you um, just clarify something for me because everything's kind of blurring together? Section three, we approve the canopy that's on the right. Correct. The option two, the more traditional canopy, and, but we thought we would still present both okay. um, on this one. It's new, new sections, kind of new scope of work on, on the back. So I guess my question then is, since we're kind of getting, we're getting some of your feedback on going for a more modern canopy, are we comfortable with the idea of there being two different kinds? Um, if that would be, they both look like they are compatible, but I also could see maybe could others could see it as not. So I wanted to kind of get your guys' input too. I think that it may it would be fine if it's consistent between that section. I mean, mm -hmm. the other section is across the road. It's a different neighborhood in a way. Um, but if it were built this way with one on the left and one on the right, it would feel really uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. if it's across the road, it's a different neighborhood, it's okay to, I mean, if anything that's an asset, it gives it a different distance of entrance. Greg, could you go to the aerial earlier up too so we can see the relation of these buildings? And so it's hard to tell plants to such a big site. It's like, right. it's, it's okay. pretty, pretty far down the road, yeah. Yeah. yeah it, well, yeah, that one. So you can see where phase one and phase two are, but then you also have those buildings that are in between that at some point will probably um, come in and, and be renovated as well. Those are not in a, an area that's um, destined for redevelopment. So it might be, to Lauren's point, it might be where conversation about which types you prefer kind of maybe south of George Mason Drive versus the ones that were in Phase one, we probably want to keep some level of consistency in that area. Yeah. It, just from a building layout under, um, understanding, can a resident go in the front or the back for the unit, or is it specific that my unit, I enter the front door? Yeah, so the, the There's front a door, is, door, right? Yeah, well, it's, yeah. it's a well, walk up where you have the front door, and that serves. The units by so we have actually lots of addresses, so there's lots of front doors okay. that just yeah. serve a you know stairwell that serves the units on each side. Okay. They're one building, but you can see how they're kind of broken up. They almost act as like multiple individual buildings within one. Like David said, you can go through one kind of corridor or landing to access your specific yeah, like unit. The, so the can, top right there is right. But all, it's, all those units, each of them have their front door that, that serves about four units. But is it something where it's like two means of egress like i can go in the front to get to my unit but if i want to go out the back door i can do that too there's no there's no back door on the unit there's the stairwell that i can okay. I think right there's a facing exit but yeah in the unit itself it acts as the okay. corridor okay from here i mean the stairwell yeah and we'd, this. we'd be creating those four new um back entrances into those units specifically they would go those would be entrances directly into those um, two bedroom units and not into the, the corridor, if that makes sense. I think I prefer to stay with one canopy type. I think the mixing and matching could be disjointed. I think if it were one development or one area um, on one side of Columbia Pike that wanted one canopy and one on the other side or like a different cluster, I think then it would make more sense, but I think the front and the back being different would be odd. Yeah. Just so I understand, are we talking about two different types on one building or two different types on two different clusters? So right now we have the more traditional, which is the one on the right that we're seeing the screen. That's for section three. And but that's the only section. section. And then this is now a different section, section four. And I agree with you, I think we should have one that is on the front and the back because those are the same. But if that's the more traditional or the bit more contemporary, right. it is what it is, and I think that's okay. Um, but I agree that it's not mix and match what's on the front and what's on the back. What's already agree, approved yeah. for section set group for section three? The one on the it's right. It's the traditional one on the right. right. But this is for a different building. So if right. it's consistent, yeah. it could be both either. Yeah. Yeah, I think that makes I think that makes sense. And also the way they were built to each section is similar, but it's a little bit different too. Because they all kind of vary a little bit here and there anyway. So I think it kind of makes sense if maybe south, you know, south of George Mason was like this type, and then maybe the corner over here 
but I wouldn't mix and match on the same building. I, I would agree. But I think the sections can differ because they, they, they differ now. So, yeah. I didn't know they differ now. So that makes me more comfortable with the difference. Yeah, we can, we can, we can research that too and, and just kind of check that. Cause I, when you go over to the second phase, which is the other yeah, side, they have different. It things. goes all over the place. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. yeah. some of those have canopies yeah. today, but they're, they're not good. nice. They're yeah. <laughs> it's like so, we, so we can we can check. We can check. Let's see how consistent it is. And I hear what you're saying. If it's there is some variability, and we have, we're in a different cluster. Okay, so we're giving you some guidance on the canopies, and we kind of narrowed it down to like three options that it seemed like everybody kind of liked with the railing. The right. It seemed like everyone likes the horizontal. Like the horizontal, horizontal yeah. either the solid metal horizontal or the cable. Mm -hmm. And I know that you seem you also kind of like the you do like the more contemporary though of like the the kind of no no you don't okay great <laughs> so then we have two so yeah. it sounds on the right the top, the top, the top on the right. Um, and I do agree. I, I am a little concerned about the maintenance with the cables. Okay. So mm -hmm. if you wouldn't, if you all could look into that and make sure that they are as durable, I do like the appearance of them, but I'm concerned about the maintenance okay. um, and the durability. So it sounds like we've given you our homework on why we should hear from you in October. Right. <laughs> well, so. Awesome. <laughs> so just so I'm clear on the the canopies, is the consensus that. The HALRB prefer option one, the more modern option for these three buildings on front and back. Can I make a suggestion that for October, if there are more commissioners here, I think that's a question for the full board because okay. we're only hearing from a fraction of folks tonight. Right. Okay. So I think as part of our presentation and part of your presentation for the next meeting, um, talk about the different options that were discussed tonight. But I really okay. think getting some additional opinions from the commission okay. would help guide you. And hopefully by next month, we can get that figured out. Yeah. I think it also would be helpful to have the site plan of where cluster sits is. Is that the one that was approved? Uh, section, section, three. Three. section three. Yeah. Um, of where that is with the traditional in relation to where we're looking now. Just to know, like, are they right next to each other? They have well, yeah. They have that. Oh, okay. Um, the site plan. Yeah, yeah that one. The gray, the gray out area is the first phase. Okay, and that is the traditional? Yes, yeah. yeah. That's what was approved. So, first phase is section three, yeah. and then the project area is yeah. section four. So, section okay. three has the more traditional canopies. There's no, uh, and then section four is the one that we're like, which one? Modern. And then traditional. the red to the left, is that a future? All of the what you're seeing is all of Barcroft. That comes later. And all yeah. of them, <laughs> and all of these are different. They're all different sections. There's actually eight sections, although, and they're identified differently yeah. um, by a different number. So we've only seen section three, and now we're seeing section four. And we're not seeing ADZ yeah. We're seeing numbers. a lot of Barcroft in the future. There'll be, yeah. be more coming. Yeah, there's 50 buildings total. Over. Rolling, we're talking less a handful of them. I almost Two. wonder if the gray we've done traditional, if everything to the right we stayed traditional. Everything south of George Mason Drive, where the rest of section I three and the imminent. I think so. The work. pink and the purple, mm -hmm. like if we yeah. stayed traditional there and that tip of the triangle is traditional, then maybe if there's that line that then to the left of it that gets the contemporary. I think it'd be weird to have like the gray area be traditional, the one in the middle be contemporary, and then the next one gray. Like I just think having some sort of rhythm or dividing line that everything on this side is one, everything on the other. I feel like the road works as a good dividing line. Well, yeah, so George Mason is a really major road, you know? Yeah, so okay. That be like really divides the, that little triangle from everything else. Yeah. yeah. Um, so if you're going to make something different, I'd almost do it on, that there, side. on the left right. side of George Mason on this map. Yeah. But I would say if, if you're going to like play with the canopies, I would be really intentional about like why you're doing it and could, trying to you know use different canopies to delineate different sections. Otherwise, I would just do everything the same. Okay. We'll yeah, we are going to get rid of them. Yeah. So maybe some. 
That's true. I would actually prefer no candy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and we'll noodle on that internally as well. I wouldn't say anything about intentionality as we move forward with future phases. Yeah. Think, think about that as well. Um, and we'll continue to present both options. And um, would, you, would you like to present both railing options again in October if we have a fuller board? I, the think, mesh so. And I the think so, but I think I think cut out, stick with the stuff on the right, cut out the stuff on the left. Okay, just the, as between the cable. Let's narrow it down. Yeah. Yeah. Helpful. We can't get the brightness to work for printouts too. Yeah. I think, yeah. 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 I think yeah. the 3D rendering helps. Yeah. 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 Were there any other questions or comments on the other aspects of the, the you, motivations? I guess for for the infill at, at the PTAC units, mm -hmm. will you be having any opportunity to, to harvest bricks like from, like from the rear to put them on the front, or will it all be sort of like new brick? Just to the p tech holes. Yeah. I'll have folks from our team opine, but um, my understanding is that on the front where we are replacing those vents with brick, we will be using salvaged brick oh, okay. from other areas of the building. Okay. But uh, Murdad or um, Sarah, if someone wants to confirm that, that'd be good. Sure. I think uh, in the <coughs> earlier section, we have limited demolition, which allows us to salvage some of the brick for use in that repair or in those repairs um, for this section. I mean, maybe we'll have enough brick. Otherwise, I think finding a suitable replacement that matches the existing. But yeah, I don't think yeah. we've made that decision. Yeah, we do have less demolition here because we're not doing the rear additions. Right. So we just have those four new um, door openings in the back to salvage brick from on these buildings. So we'll do what we can in terms of using salvage brick on the front. I am here. Great. Can you hear me well? Yeah, I can hear you great. Wonderful. Um, if you'd like, I can just share my screen. Oh, never mind. There it is. Did um, that work? This is perfect. Yeah. Okay. Um, I I think it'll. Can I like take control because I think I want to like quickly just talk about some things that. Sure. Um, and like be able to point them out on my screen. Yeah. Go ahead right. and share yours. That's fine. All right. I just requested control. So if you allow, you Got should it. be able to see my finger, my like mouse scrolling okay. across the screen. I see it. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you all so much. Um, uh, as was mentioned, my name is Max Ewert. I am an uh, associate planner with the Department of Parks and Recreation. I've been here um, several times to talk about this sign, and we're, we're really excited about the progress that we've seen um, to get to the point where we are today, though I do think that there are some um, minor adjustments that still need to be made that I think we can maybe do post a post vote a vote that would be in an ideal world but we can discuss that uh, later um so last time we were here we got a lot of feedback on um the uh inset map on the kind of confusing nature of uh some of the um like the legend in the bottom here um and in some of the language, we heard some feedback between uh, community members and 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 folks who are on the board, and and that, along with some of the insight we've gotten from our own DPR leadership, has kind of led us to where we are today. Um, the primary comments we've been getting from um, DPR leadership is that it's 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 a lot. It's a lot of information, and and our kind of like. Um, uh, uh, kind of like guiding North Star for interpretive signs in in our DPR parks is to is that less is more and and we want folks to be able to kind of look at it, absorb the information, and 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 move on and enjoy the park and let someone else who's curious uh, uh, come by and and learn as well. Um, and I think we have um, balanced that a little bit. Um, I don't want, want to read 
straight through it. Um, I've received some some comments from Serena on the language and and there's some edits that I think we want to make as well. Um, but I do want to kind of point out a couple of things that uh, graphically that I think we we will be changing and, and I'm curious if they align with um, folks on the board's thoughts on this too. The first one being is that I don't think that it's necessary to add or bold um, some of these additional stations um, along this route here. I think it would be totally fine to just leave Arlington Junction Station as the one highlighted and pointing to it here. Um, I think the all of the, the stations on here um, uh, kind of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It it uh, kind of crowds it a little bit and, and makes it a, a little too hectic. Um, and also, if you look close enough, you can already see the names on the map and it, it gets a little redundant at times. Um, something uh, else that we um, would like to do is to, um, and and I'm really we're really open to hearing hearing your thoughts on this. Is that we we've gotten a lot of feedback on just how kind of instrumental this site was to like the historic nature of the of the trolley line and the canal. And there's also other local history that was really important to the site as well. Um, and so one thing that we're exploring, and we, we chatted with Serena about this, um, but I'm curious to hear your feedback is maybe including something like a QR code um, where it would lead to the project page that already exists for Arlington Junction Park, where it can kind of expand more on the history. And that way we can really simplify the language on the sign. And if folks are really interested in learning more, they can scan that code and, and move, um, and it'll take them to the page on their phone. Um, some feedback that we got from Serena already on this is that we just don't know how long QR codes are going to be viable. And so would that be something that we would put on the sign and then um, it would be completely obsolete within a number of years? I don't really know the time frame for that, so I can't really speak to that. But one kind of solution that we've thought to move around that is to not include the QR code on the sign itself, but to maybe include it on the sign post. Um, that way it would be uh, um, something that we wouldn't have to get like uh, more precisely printed, but we have signposts like um, like uh, within like the, the inventory of the uh, PNR Par Parks and Natural Resources Division that can just be swapped out if if it becomes obsolete or um, weathering happens and we need to get it replaced or something like that. Um, so. Uh, with that said, open to hearing uh, some of your thoughts on this and uh, really excited to, to move forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. We do have a public speaker, Mr. Byrne, is signed up to speak. So, um, Mr. Byrne, would you like to start? You have uh, three minutes to speak. Yeah, yeah um, yes. Uh, it's interesting. I just uh, heard that Mr. Yordi is planning to, um, to change that map. Uh, so, but I'll mention some of the things that the the map of the um the, the, the marker is generally satisfactory. However, there are a few some errors that it needs cor to correct, particularly on the map. The map has typographical errors. Um, Jackson City and uh, and New Alexandria are, are misspelled. Uh, you might want to miss just eliminate both of them. Uh, Jackson City is kind of interesting locally, though. You might want to leave it. Uh, get rid of the Mount Pleasant Station because the the railroad never went there. Uh, so, however, uh, as I've written you to, the, 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 the railroad terminated in Is it supposed to be not over? I think so. Yeah. Mr. Bernie, are you there? Sorry, Bernie, you froze. We'll give you back your time if you come back on. Um, Dr. Byrne has sent um, a lot of these comments to me, and I've been forwarding them to Serena. Um, McCall, I don't, I don't mind forwarding them to you as well if if he's not able to reconnect. Uh, sure, you can, you can um, go ahead and, and send them to me. Okay, just, just so they're accessible. Send it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. That was the only one for this item. Yeah. Well, um, Dr. Byrne, if he comes back mm -hmm. on, 
we can give him uh, his time back. Okay. Yeah. He's trying to come back. In. Oh, okay. okay. While we're waiting for that, do you all want to go ahead and provide any comments, suggestions to Mr. Stewart? I like the idea of the QR code on the sign mm -hmm. post instead of on the actual sign. Um, I think it gives the flexibility and the, um, I don't know, I guess the longevity of the plaque. Um, to not be to not become outdated. Yeah. It'll be reincorporated to something later. We did a, I don't know, a historic map of Arlington something or other in the yeah. future. We could switch it out or the QR code needs to lead somewhere else. To get that That's true. So, yeah, but optionality with that, yeah, you can, yeah, that makes sense. I could see it becoming a fun series. <laughs> this is kind of tangential, but I have like a, a dream of doing like a geocaching in parks, and I think they could be repurposed for that too, in some way, shape, or form. Um, but that's mostly me just musing on something that I think would be a lot of fun, um, but not related to this. Let's make it happen. Great. <laughs> yeah, John, would you like to speak? I see your hand up. Yeah, um, I provide some feedback last month and I just wanted to say, I think this looks great. Um, I like that you're considering unbolding those uh, stations. Um, has there been any consideration at all of just maybe getting rid of them, uh, the names and just having Arlington Junction there uh, so you don't have those stations out there or have people just prefer to have the station names there for reference? Yeah, that's, um, that is my, preference is to just remove them all except for yeah. Arlington Junction Station and and McCall I don't I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name correctly it's um, Michael but that's Michael. Okay. I'm, used, I'm used to it <laughs> all right well Michael if you if you if you could zoom in a little bit you can see the station names on the map yeah and so when it's when it's like live and in person and it's like two and a half feet by by three feet size or 30 30 by 20. Yeah, it's only two and a half feet by one and three quarters. You'll be able to see the station names on there. Like you can see Penrose, you can see Knock, you can see um, Arlington Junction on there already. It doesn't need to get bolded. It it, it does. It makes it more hectic and, and a little bit redundant. Yeah, and I I think also too, given a lot of the stations are actually in Alexandria, it creates mm -hmm. at least for me. Um, I mean, it's it's a relatively minor thing. So I'm glad you've already gone there. Um, I guess the other question I had too, and it just might be impossible to do, but um, visually, you know, you're reading the left to the right there, and then you see the map mm. in the middle. Have there been any some any attempts to kind of move things around a little bit so you can have all the text kind of align in one area? Because what's happening for me is as I'm reading from left downwards, I'm getting I don't want to say distracted because distracted is the wrong thing. Uh, this is a great plan, but um, I'm getting kind of confused when I when yeah. I go to the right. Like I've kind of lost interest in that last paragraph there. And I'm sure you guys have already thought through this, but it's not a deal breaker per se, but um, it's hard for me to kind of like focus on. I definitely it. think there's there's potential for rearranging. Maybe we could do the image of the of the station itself um, kind of like top center as opposed to in the top right corner and then shift the map a little bit to the to the right and then be able to have the that final paragraph adjacent to the to the first three paragraphs. I think there is definitely room for for movement, and that's something that we can take to the um, our design firm that's been that's been working on this project with us to to see if it would be something they could do. Awesome. Um, and yeah, and uh, it's a it's a small thing, but there is a lot of white space in between that image at the top and then the paragraph at the bottom. It, it really does create kind of this strange visual tension for me and and I realize this is a bit uh, beyond kind of scope or anything else but that's wonderful that you guys have already thought of it but I I think this looks great from uh, last month I I know you guys have put a lot of hard work into it so thank you thank you well, I appreciate that and we'll be sure to, to send your comments to the folks who have been helping us out oh sure and I also wanted to say I think the QR code thing is really cool so I'm glad you guys are thinking of that yeah 
it's hard it's hard to get all the information you want to on a single sign and uh, for folks who are really interested in learning more about the history i think it's a really good opt-in yeah well thank you so much for all of this yeah thank you for the map and i guess i didn't realize it at first is it possible to reduce the size of like the four mile run del rey jones point and all of that and move arlington junction onto it maybe yeah. a four mile run i think i missed arlington junction being pointed out at first yeah that's definitely Just an option because with the line it kind of blends into the road and it's so far off on the side yeah it, it looks like it could be another rail line yeah. yeah on that i think that it maybe just graphically at the bottom it's kind of confusing because the same thing's happening there is a call out mm. like a you are here moment that then goes horizontally and then vertically to a key that doesn't seem to connect it might make sense just to make it a key and use the same symbol for the arlington junction point um mm -hmm. yeah i like the idea of using the same the same symbol on both maps to show where you are ah uh, uh, i see um uh, because at first I wasn't sure they were the same. And then one's labeled Arlington Junction, one's label, labeled Arlington Junction Park site. Mm -hmm. So I was not 100% that that was like the same place. Yeah, so so one of them, one of them would be the Arlington Junction station, which is what the electric okay, trolley so station was. And then one of them is like roughly where the park is on that canal map. So they, they are slightly different. I think one, like if it existed, in its same space today, it would be across the street from each other. Um, but I, I, think think that, I think that I think that I think that's fine to still do that. I mean, they're they're close enough, and um, we're roughly pointing to the same location. So not scale the we map. Can, I think it's okay. Yeah, and yeah. I, I mean the top scale map is is not small enough scale to like yeah have a difference between across the street. So yeah, it's really the agreed. For the, I think it's highlighted. I'm not sure if it's something to address or it was addressed. Are we changing slaves to enslaved persons, or was it? Um, that's that's one of the language that we're gonna be um, working adjusting. On. Okay, and, cool. Yeah. Just check it. So, Mr. Byrne has not been able to join us again, but I was able to get comments from Max. So I will just read some of them out so that. I know he's not here to present them himself, but at least it can kind of go into the record. So um, he sent along a corrected map. Um, so looking at that like center map portion of the marker, he wanted Mount Pleasant to be struck from the map. Um, and he noted that Jason City should be Jackson City. He noted that Alexandria was spelled incorrectly. Um, and he wanted let's see, corrected map of the route really with the location of the Washington terminal marked. Ah, he wanted a new marking for the Washington terminal, so like DC, like right in the center there. Mm -hmm. And and then as I already noted, the names of Jackson City and New Alexandria uh, stations corrected, and then Mount Pleasant Station removed. Uh, did I get everything that you understood? From his comments, Max. Yeah, out of, just like out of curiosity, do um, does the does the board have a preference to maybe point out some locations or to just point out Arlington Junction Station on the the interior map? I don't mind having additional cities because I think mm. it gives some context. But I think if there's a way to I don't know, make Arlington Junction a little bigger and the others a little smaller, but all within the same mm -hmm. part of the map and maybe changing the key or just trying to emphasize it a little bit more. Yeah. The okay. context doesn't hurt. Yeah, I think that's... you were saying that the map, you really will see like Alexandria and I mean, I can see Del Rey. Like you'll see these names on like the under you know the part that's not overlaid with the name with the actual printed names mm -hmm. so those are fine for me just like okay. the, the map and yeah. just using our text for only arlington junction 
Okay. You still need the dots though, yeah, because it's hard to tell what mm. actually is the railway and what's just another street. Yeah, I okay. agree with that too. Yeah, because Alexander's pointing out on here, and it's not a it's not a rail stop. It's it's just listed as like the city itself. It's kind yeah, of yeah. What's what? I, I like that idea. I think maybe keeping keeping the the points of where the stations were, and mm -hmm. then removing the names could be helpful to just make just kind of like linearly show how the track kind of flowed. John, did you have your hand up again, or was it a holdover from the last time? Well, that was actually the point that Omari just made. I think if you left okay. the, uh, I agree, you're leaving the uh, rail stops in there, I think would be really, really good. Uh, but maybe removing the rail station names, except for uh, Arlington Junction. One other thing on the two maps that I think would be nice is a date for each of them. Mm, okay. Yeah, um, that'll be helpful. I can add that for sure. Max, I, I know you mentioned this maybe last month, um, but that Alexandria Canal below, that's part of the image, right? The uh, the blue uh, text, that's- Yeah, part okay. that's part of the original image. Okay, yeah. It's... Is it blue? Maybe it's uh, green. I, think it's, I was gonna say, I don't see anything blue. It looks black to me. It looks blue. I, I, get, blue. I get blue too, yeah. Oh, uh, like a navy? Yeah, I can make it. Yeah, yeah, it's like, yeah. The human eye. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But yeah, either way, I, it would be difficult to remove that and have it be clean. No, actually, I think when I was in the room last month, it looked black. So. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's contrast. Yeah. So I think well, I think what we can do is I think there are definitely fixes that need to be made. I think there are a lot of good recommendations. So I think. Perhaps we'll make a motion, and then we'll we'll make a motion to to approve it, perhaps, and then we'll we'll, we'll go from there. But I think there are a lot of like things need to be changed, but at the same time, I think the, I think the gist the, the gist of it's there. Mm -hmm. so, um, well. Out of out of curiosity, and this is more of a, a process question for uh, historic preservation staff. Um, do you provide like a, a so I, I'm at, at the Parks and Rec Commission. We provide like a monthly report out on on stuff, on projects that are going on in the county that are parks related. Um, I would be happy to kind of like stay in touch with you guys and make sure that um, like the final draft and of that ends up going to um, like to get printed is is seen by the board and ma make sure that we're incorporating your recommendations um, so that there's some sort of I don't know. Feedback. It's not just you're uh, voting on this and then you're trusting it implicitly. We we appreciate that. I, I was just going to say, Mr. Chair, you might want to consider if you do make a motion to mm -hmm. approve it, mm -hmm. then to make any final edits and mm -hmm. clarifications with DPR and the historic preservation staff. Oh, staff. Okay. Come and on. then if, if you want to bring it, Max, as a courtesy review back, you know, by all means, we would welcome mm -hmm. you um, okay. if you if you wanted to do that. Okay. I think that that makes makes sense. It's, it's generally there, but obviously there are a lot of things that are need to be tweaked. So I'll put out the motion. We'll, we'll go from there. And always put that motion. Um, so I'm going to at the HRB approve DPR historic marker or Austin Junction as submitted, including any outstanding uh, text or design edits. Um, I guess. Uh, should I, in terms of sort of having him bring it back, should I let's say that? Coordinate with. Um, say conditionally approve, and then oh, the conditionally final approve. review okay. coordination. Okay. Well, yeah, so initially approve. Um, I'm with HSRB, conditionally approve the DPR circuit marker for other junction as submitted, including any, any text edits, sorry, any. Any, any outstanding text or design edits um, uh, per per coordination with uh, HLRB DPR and HLRB staff. That's what I actually Let me read that out. Did you catch it? I did. Yeah. I'm just gonna edit it to HPP staff instead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay so. I have, I move that the HALRB conditionally approve the DPR historic marker for Arlington Junction 
as submitted, including any outstanding text or design edits per coordination with DPR and HPP staff. Does that capture what you wanted to? Yeah, it does. I'm not sure if it's perfect in the wrong location. But yeah, that yeah, captures it. Yeah. So we do need a second, though. A second. All right, Mr. Aiken. Yes. Mr. Davis. Yes. Ms. Foster. Yes. Well, yes. <laughs> Just, Just confirming. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Meyer. Yes. Ms. Myers. Yes. Mr. Wenchel. Yes. That's unanimous. Awesome. Thank you so much, and uh, I appreciate all your your help throughout this process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Have a good evening. is a review of site plan markers for the courthouse landmark project and we have um, our consultants here wait this is weird it's, oh they already got oh there yeah. them oh, yeah i'm just grabbing papers it's nope. the non-map okay. hey, kim you introduce yourself hi i'm kim Miller. um i am the director of technical preservation at hc tree trees um and i've been working on the north courthouse site for yeah, long time. <laughs> so, uh, Courthouse Landmark is our uh, site plan project that is right outside the building over here. Um, it was approved by the county board in 2021, and it involves a very large new building, um, and it also involves three, sorry, two historic facades. I don't know, I'm just mm -hmm. Um, the uh, first federal savings and loan building, which uh, a lot of people like to reference as the COSI building, um, and that is getting facade preservation and is put back up right now. Um, and then also the another building, um, the investment building, which uh, that is also a historic facade and it has been moved from its more central location to the corner of 15th and Courthouse. That's right. So, um, and part of the site plan, one of the site plan conditions is that the um, applicant needed to do um, uh, educational interpretation signage, um, but we didn't really give them any other direction than that. So Kim and I have been kind of trying to come up with something. And so Kim, I will let you take it away and go ahead and go over what we're looking at, which is the text for three signs right we landed on three signs um one for the investment building um one for the first federal savings and loan and then one for um the history of lawyers row which um used to be um in this area and now it's kind of gone so it's honoring what the land was um, prior to all this new construction um so this is the first federal savings and loan and i won't read it word for word. I don't know if you guys have had a chance to read it before, but um, we really wanted to address um, kind of, um, you know, the international style commercial buildings and um, how they tied with Arlington and um, the growing needs of the, the county um, post-World War II, um, the design aspects that are uh, stylistic of the international commercial style, um, and then we also wanted to address that uh, when it was listed and the HRI, why it was listed. Um, and then the last paragraph we go on to discuss, um, you know, how we decided to restore it to its original look, not how it was altered to be. There was a third floor added and a bay added to the east, uh, which kind of threw off the balance of the building. So we brought it back to its original design. Um, and um, just kind of addressed things like that. Um, we went through many, many um, a draft, so we're, we're happy to take any comments or questions. Um, I don't know if you want to go through. Could you do a quick one? summary for each of them? Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay, great. Um, so for the investment building, is that what I'm sure. um, we also wanted to highlight its um, Right. Yeah. Um, this one's a little bit shorter, um, but 
but uh, we, we did want to highlight it's also um, international style commercial building. Um, it, it's actually a, a pretty elegant international style building, if I do say so myself, that it's all clean. Um, and talk about the developer that developed it, who was a big developer here in Arlington. His name is very recognizable. Um, and then discuss that it was a private building for a very short amount of time, and then the county actually bought it and it housed county services for a number of years after that. Um, and then we also go on to talk about um, why it was listed in the HRI and um, why it was moved to the um, corner to accommodate, once again, the growing um, community of Arlington County and the need for housing. Um, and in order to accommodate both historic and um, new housing, we had to, to make room on the block. Um, so we talk about how the pieces were taken down and put back up, but just in a slightly different location. Kim, hold on one second. Hey, John, can you confirm, can you see we're sharing the text of the investment building right now? Can you tell me yes. if you're seeing that? I am you... seeing it. Perfect, okay. But can you see us in the room? Yes, I can see you in the room as well. Great. Okay, Great. thank you. Yeah. Dark. Um, yeah. Sorry, I thought I yeah. lost connection with you. Okay, okay. No. Thank, thank sorry. You. Thank you. So sorry to interrupt. Okay. Oh, technology. Okay. Thanks, Kim. Go ahead and keep going. Um, and then if you scroll down. Um, Is that it again? <laughs> Yep. Uh, so again, discussing the plan about how we um, accommodated new construction and historic construction together to make um, kind of both worlds <laughs> viable in, in such a growing county. Um, and then um, I think if we go to this one. Yep. Okay. And so um, the lawyer's row really kind of morphed a, a couple times when we were writing about it. Um, and. Lauren wanted to, and rightly so, discuss the first um, courthouse here in Arlington, why there was a courthouse in Arlington um, when it broke off from Alexandria and um, Arlington County had its own seat of court. Um, so we kind of addressed the history of that building. It had a, a big evolution with a number of additions on it. So we highlight the growth and expansion of the courthouse. Um, and that's really where Lawyers Row came from. It was a, um, a lower scale block that held a lot of the offices of the bailiffs, of the lawyers, um, of, of all the people that worked in the courthouse around that building. Um, and then we talk about how the current courthouse was put in and Lawyers Row kind of slowly <laughs> faded away. Uh, but we do, and we have the images showing the, the buildings themselves, we do identify the buildings that were on Lawyers Row and the dates that they were constructed. Yeah, that's, that's good. I think, the, um, again, Kim and I were really trying to appreciate all the work that they put into this, and they've given me a bit of a preview of some of the photographs that we have. So but we wanted to kind of see how the direction is going. I know that, um, can you talk a little bit about the location of where you think these might be or how this might be presented? Or are you also wanting feedback on that too? Um, well, we, we would love feedback on all of it. Um, if, they, if there are aspects of the history that we're just not addressing or you want it fleshed out a little bit more or if you think it's redundant, um, we'd love input on that. Um, in terms of the layout, uh, for the courthouse itself, unfortunately, we don't have a very high-res photo of the historic courthouse. We, we are continuing to look. Um, we have one of it um, in later years with all of its additions. It's not a great photograph, um, but we continue to look for an excellent one of the original um, courthouse. We do have a, a sandboard map showing all of the additions and the original layout, but um, it's, it's one of those sandboard maps where they taped over and taped over and taped over. So it's not the prettiest, it's in high res, but it's not the prettiest map. Um, so, you know, any input into images that you guys have seen or know where to look, I'm ha would happy to have, have that. Um, in terms of the lawyer's row building specifically, I think we want to do um, an aerial or a map with the buildings numbered and then have, if not all of them, because I think there are five or six, um, maybe images of just the most architecturally interesting. They're not 
these are these were low scale office buildings. They aren't very beautiful in design. So maybe one or two of the more interesting buildings could be highlighted in pictures, and the others just the name and the date. Um, but any any other input on that would be great to have. I do have a question. So are mm -hmm. are those all these lawyers row buildings still there? No, no, they're all gone now. Right. Yep. No the, courthouse, no lawyers row. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. the other two. So um, there is uh, what is it? Courthouse, the courthouse addendum. The courthouse sector plan addendum. Thank you. So that was done in 2015, and that gave some direction to do a documented history of lawyers row as well as the investment building and first federal savings and loan building. And so from there, that kind of directed how the site plan was supposed to kind of approach it. And so Traceries has done uh, the documentation that we've needed, kind of like a mini historic structures report of all those buildings, some that got torn down and some that were still around to tw until 2020. Right, I think it was the, it was a subway for a long time. Yeah, that was yeah. one of the original lawyers row buildings, yeah. but it's now gone. Yeah, um, there were like maybe two on that block left. And okay. Yeah. Okay. Maybe put. Oh, you do have all five buildings were demolished in 1990. Okay. To make way for the new county. Kim, let me do some mm -hmm. digging. I think we might have a photo of the whole courthouse. That would I be great. It, so I will let you know. <laughs> and I know that we have topic. there's. There, I mean, I know you've done we, a lot of have, research. We have a lot of photos of the courthouse. None of just none of them are of the quality that could be printed on a sign. But, okay. I know, think like, I even have some blueprints that were given to us. That would be but great. I need to look. Yeah, you do. Okay. Is that what that is? Five. It's the courthouse, yeah, it's right? Okay. We'll okay. get back to you. Yeah, <laughs> no, that would be okay. great. We could high res scan them and, and have that on the sign. For Jerry's comment shared. Or do those only go internal? I think that, I think, it, I don't think it got published. I don't think it was public. Me public. Or are you asking if it was shared with mm -hmm. the applicant? No. I don't know. Did we share with you comments that um, one of our HLRB members made? Okay. Okay, fine. So mm -hmm. we'll share that with you. Okay. So, um, and you're probably coming back. Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, obviously the layouts all have to be done and yeah. But for the layouts for the other two building um, for the first federal savings and loan, I think we were going to show it with the expansion and we have one image of it originally, um, which isn't the best high res, but that's kind of what we based all of the design decisions on. So I feel it would be important to have that. Um, for the other building, um, showing an image showing its original location, or maybe a Sanborn map showing its original location, and then highlighting where it was moved to, so someone can visualize. Oh, yeah, it used to be in the middle of the block, and now it's on the corner. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was also thinking of um, we have drawings from Calvert Stone, which is the mason that took down all of the limestones cleaned them and then put them back in the exact place. So we have the drawings that have like literally every single stone of every building numbered, which I think would be a cool idea for people to see like the level of detail that went into, you know, we didn't just put them back willy nilly, we put them back with purpose. Um, and some of the stones were in a different location, which I think is discussed in the text and the reason behind that. Um, I actually have a question. Do you all feel that the some of the information we realized is kind of repeating? Um, do you? But we also, but I also don't have context exactly on how the signs. You're envisioning that they're going to all be next to each other in the same location. I was envisioning that lawyers row and investment building, right? That that's one yep. that moved yep. would be closer together, and then the first federal savings and loan would be on the opposite. Like corner. a Yule, like yeah, a Yule where that because that's going to be like a more pedestrian friendly yeah. um, and wider sidewalk according to the county plan. Um, so I think that would be a better location for that for that sign because you wouldn't. You wouldn't want to read it and then walk around the corner to see it. Um, so two would be closer together. But if there are suggestions of a different place for lawyers row on that block, 
So will Lawyer's Row be, be where Lawyer's Row used to be, essentially? I mean, will it be in front of it, or? If we put it on the border or? where the investment building is now, which yeah. is on 15th, that mm -hmm. is That's that is the former Lawyer's Row. That's okay. where the old subway was, okay. right on the corner. Okay. Yeah, I would definitely put them as close to where they were as possible. Yeah. I guess the one's kind of tough because it was move, moved. Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> I don't know if you put it, it in front of the new one. A couple hundred one. feet. So like you okay. can still stand in front of it and be like, oh, it was right there. Okay. Where, the, where you could, will clearly see is the residential entrance to the new tower. Okay. Um, right. So you will be able to kind of visualize why it was moved as well. Like, okay. So yes, there was purpose to repeating in a different way some of the preservation information um, and how it got reinstalled because again, we weren't, I wasn't sure exactly where they were going to be in relation to each other. So if someone is only seeing the first federal savings and loan and they don't see the other ones, they at least get the, my selfish one to talk about the level of energy we had to put into figuring out the preservation approach of that um, historic facade. So. Yeah, I didn't notice. I just really quickly scanned them, but I thought they all read really nicely and I didn't notice too much repeating. So I also want to pitch one other idea and I can I've mentioned it, so I'm going to just put it out on the record. Mm -hmm. I have been wanting one of our historic markers to take a new leap into the way people interpret uh, the information. And that is the idea of doing some type of acrylic sign mm -hmm. that is outlining what was there before so that people can see through it to the new building and i don't know if that's something that could be incorporated in with this i don't know that would be a level it would be a whole different direction mm -hmm. but maybe it could be an interesting vantage point for people when they're out there because i'm always concerned that people are going to see the text and they're going to be like even though it's only 250 words or so they're going to walk past it but if you have something right there where they can just stop and look it's it's an interesting way to kind of get it. We don't have that yet. I feel like you could do that with the first federal savings and loan in the little park. Mm -hmm. um, so you're across the street from the building, but you have distance, but then if you're seeing through the sign, right. you can really, you'll see the building better than if it was right next to the building. Right. Kind of have to step back and go, oh, yeah. wow, that was a third floor and there was a, yeah. another bay wing. Yeah. Um, I think the other, Investment building in large road might be hard to do that, but for yeah. federal savings and loan, it's certainly something we could. It would be interesting also to show how, because that the building when you pass by it now, it is our take on a very grainy newspaper image mm -hmm. of what the original building looked like, and then it got a side edition and a roof edition, and we basically Montpelier it by removing that and bringing it back. So. That could be an approach to go. So I wanted to pitch that idea and see what people thought. I really like that idea. I mean, I think you bring up a good point about the vantage point, though. If it's too close, you look yeah. through it. And yeah. Just looking at a wall, it's hard. But if it were well sighted, that would be so cool. And I think it's a lot more interactive, and more people would stop to look at it, especially since it is kind of engaging. Have you seen precedents in other places that are doing it? Because I worry about like acrylic aging and yellowing. I've seen them as like a glass etching. Not so yeah. much plexiglass, but then that's a maintenance issue. That's a they, an address. expense issue. But that's I think that's something we could definitely look into a bit. We like Lauren said, we've never done it before it here. Great. And yeah. this lends itself, I think, well to a different approach. Not for all three necessarily, but maybe for one. Or even a portion of one. Yeah. Yeah. It could also be interesting and maybe it's on the back. So it's not as visible or distracting with the text, but to almost do like a line drawing of what it was. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that way it's really clear of this is what it used to look like, this is what it is now. Yeah. But I think that would also be challenging to try to get. There's some challenges to the concept. So can if we could kind of explore, I would like to see if it's an option and maybe we can come back and see what we found out. I'm concerned that we might kill a lot of ants, you know, if it's if it's a big divine glass. I'm sure there's ways to prevent that. So but um, <laughs> but uh, I think it would be interesting to explore the idea if your client's comfortable with that. Yeah, I will start with that with the uh, Okay. Thank you. So if anyone else has any comments on the text, yeah, you can let me know and then I can communicate them again. Yeah.
And we'll send you the comments from the member if you want. Great. Okay. Thank you. Right. I appreciate it. Right. Thank you. Okay, so the next item we're going to be going over is the Plan Langston Boulevard study. It's happening. Natasha, are you there? I'm here, and so is Hi. Ryan. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hello. Please introduce yourselves. Sure. Um, so Ryan is online. He hasn't turned on the camera yet, but uh, <laughs> my name is <laughs> Natasha Alfonso Ahmed. I'm the project manager for the Langston Boulevard uh, planning Hello. study. And Ryan is with ACOM. Um, there he is. And he is the planning Hello. consultant who has assisted the county with the study, including um, a historic and cultural resources survey, which we'll talk to you a little bit about later today. So, Natasha, you just want to go ahead and do you have the presentation up on your computer? Can you share your screen? I do. There is something already on the screen. Can I just take over? Yes. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. All right. So, give me Please. one second. You can give Michael a break. <laughs> Hi, Ryan. How are you? Uh, doing well. Good. It's been a while. It's been a minute. I haven't seen you in forever. <laughs> yeah, there was a pandemic in there, I think. <laughs> yes. There was. That's for sure. OK, well, I'm ready if, if you all are. Please go right ahead, Natasha. OK, great. So tonight what we're going to do is I'm going to give a quick overview of sort of the policies and the recommendations for the, the general plan, which really applies to the whole area and covers nine key planning elements. And then Lauren is going to take over the second half of the presentation and she's going to explain uh, more specifically, you know, what went into the historic and cultural resources survey. Um, the policies related to historic and cultural resources and some of the recommendations, um, you know, in a little bit more detail. And then Ryan is going to be here uh, again to provide any uh, information or uh, regarding the survey or anything related to the planning study. So sorry, I just have to move a few things around. There we go. All right, so can you all see the slides OK? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right, so if I can advance, there we go. So. As most of you are probably already aware, staff is in the process of developing and ultimately adopting a comprehensive high level vision for the corridor that will guide both public and private investment long term. We are currently completing phase three of a multi phase planning study, uh, which began in 2019. Based on uh, extensive analysis and community feedback, we recently developed the draft plan that was released in June. This is the the draft prior to the RTA draft. So we're getting ready to prepare an RTA draft um, at the end of September for uh, October PC and, and county board hearing. So this is really sort of a preliminary draft that we released in June. Um, and that includes new policies to support the goals and the vision for a green main street, as well as preliminary information on implementation. There we go. OK, so the plans, vision and recommendations for corridor white elements, which are uh, specifically for transportation and open space, stormwater, public spaces and all that apply to uh, the complete planning area. But the recommendations are really focused primarily on the core study area for neighborhoods uh, two, three and five, which are outlined in, in pink on this map and includes areas that are located on or near Langston Boulevard areas designated for commercial or multifamily uses on the on the county's general land use plan and in very limited locations it includes areas that have single detached homes um, neighborhood areas one and four which are east falls church and cherry Dole respectively they have adopted plans and policies that will continue to apply in those areas all right um so the plans, policies and recommendations are centered around sustainability, environmental resilience and equity by applying a sustainable and equitable approach to land uses by leveraging proximity to transit and existing activity centers to reduce travel times and carbon emissions and by increasing housing supply um, and meeting the needs of diverse residents and household types along the corridor. The plan proposes uh, 
sorry, this is just so delayed. There we go. OK, so the plan proposes goals and policies for nine key planning elements that are supported by design principles and guidelines related to the built environment and the public realm. The core study area is primarily characterized by low rise commercial land uses, surface parking lots and pockets of multifamily residential properties. Surrounding the corridor are lower density residential neighborhoods, which comprise approximately 72% of the planning area. Um, the commercial areas have extensive impervious surfaces and aging buildings that are certainly not energy efficient. And other than in Cherrydale and East Falls Church, the corridor for the most part lacks the mixed use development that supports this walkable Main Street environment and Green Street environment. So the current housing mix in the planning area provides very little opportunities for lower or middle income households. And as we know, the county's population overall is, is less racially diverse, younger and more affluent than the larger sort of metropolitan region. The corridor itself also has very low percentages of residents of color, is uh, more affluent, but slightly older than the county as a whole. So the plan uses the county's equity lens to understand whether and where uh, racial inequities exist or are being exacerbated by this plan. And it does include recommendations to mitigate that or at least minimize the burdens for current and future um, residents. So there are 12 historic resources that are uh, wholly or partially within the planning area um, and are listed in the National Register of Historic Places and the Virginia uh, Landmarks Register. The Virginia Department of Historic Resources has determined that two historic districts are potentially eligible for listing in both of these, um, and those include the Leeway Overly and uh, Old Dominion Historic Districts. Additionally, there are seven properties within the planning area that are also designated as local historic districts. So during phase one of the planning study, ACOM conducted a uh, cultural resources survey to assist the county in identifying and, and recognizing resources along the corridor that increase um, public understanding and appreciation for the corridor's architectural and, and cultural history. This survey uh, evaluated uh, really non-traditional resource types like gathering places, objects, significant stories, events, people, um, and even uh, cultural activities and public art in, in the planning areas. Um, and like I said, Lauren will provide more information on the findings and the recommendations from that analysis in, in the second part of this. Apologies, this is just running really quickly. Okay. So to achieve the vision for a green main street that links uh, neighborhoods to businesses, mixed use activity nodes, housing and public spaces, um, we need a new land use framework. And what you can see on this map is how development should be concentrated in the mixed use activity hubs, connected by areas that are predominantly multifamily um, in order to be able to expand opportunities for increasing the housing supply along the corridor and therefore um, affordability. So the plan proposes four new activity hubs in addition to the East Falls Church and Cherrydale, ones that already exist. The policies on building form are aimed at achieving context sensitive building design by focusing the tallest building heights at the activity hubs at key intersections and within walking distance of transit or metro. Um, it also does that by establishing minimum setbacks, upper story stepbacks and, and desired height transitions. The plan's goal is to incentivize positive change in these core areas by providing other choices besides by right development. And as we have indicated in the past, additional density and height is needed to encourage special exception development that helps implement the vision and achieve many of the communities as well as the county uh, communities aspirations as well as the county's goals for increased housing supply affordability, sustainability and resilience and expanded network of public spaces. So as most of you know, Langston Boulevard is car, car centric with narrow sidewalks, minimal tree coverage, wide lanes that encourage high speeds and vehicular traffic, um, which is very harsh for pedestrians and bicyc bicyclists. It's mostly four lanes wide with the exception of a six lane segment east of I-66. The greatest impediment um, 
for people uh, along Langston Boulevard is the numerous driveways that create conflicts between all modes of travel, um, which results in a lot of uh, crashes and fatalities. And so the plan promotes new streetscapes, trees and additional amenities along Langston Boulevard and other streets to create a more pedestrian uh, and bike friendly environment. All right, so the policies and tra transportation focus on creating complete streets that accommodate again all those modes of travel adequately and safely. Uh, they also focus on reducing driveways to minimize those conflict points, expanding the street, pedestrian and bicycle networks, enhancing transit service and promoting different parking strategies. To support businesses and and other uses. There are existing, there are 24 existing public spaces in the planning area with varying types of amenities. However, they're not all very well connected and many of the neighborhoods lack uh, the right types of, of public spaces. So with increased growth, there will be a need for additional public spaces in the core areas. And the policies for public spaces, uh, which are in alignment with the PSMP, focus on again, expanding that network of, of spaces, um, through privately owned public spaces or POPs with redevelopment. It also focuses on providing a variety of space types and expanding the connection to those spaces. So through this plan, there's an opportunity to achieve an additional 28 spaces in the core, uh, albeit over time. But some of the new public spaces that, that have been proposed are actually near um, the historic and cultural resources that were identified in order to provide an opportunity to highlight, again, important narratives, or stories associated with those resources um, in the form of public art, signage, or other interpretive methods. And lastly, on the stormwater management framework, um, as most of you may know, approximately 70% of the core area is impervious. Uh, which is also located along the top of 13 watersheds, um, and that causes uh, in, incredible flooding down to downstream neighborhoods, um, which as we have seen in the past few years have created um, many challenges for those communities. And so in addition to that, only 21% of the core area has tree canopy coverage compared to the county average of 40%. So that says a lot about the existing conditions. The plan recommends um, adding specific tree canopy targets for private development in addition to public facilities and schools. And it also recommends detention and overland relief in very specific locations um, where the new parks or plazas are being proposed um, as part of the redevelopment to be able to detain water or at least provide a safe path for that water to flow and minimize the impact to downstream communities. So as I said before, the plan's goal is to incentivize uh, positive change in these core areas by providing uh, other choices besides by right development, which, as we know, is only going to exacerbate the problems that we have today. And so this overall could require a greater reliance on public funds and uh, fewer strategic sort of public private projects to achieve the desired improvements and overall lengthening the time that it will take to meet many of our uh, countywide priorities. On the other hand, if we proactively plan for this change in coordination with other policies and plans um, that are countywide, we have a better chance of controlling the outcome and meeting the goals uh, of the county and, and many of the community's aspirations. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lauren and have her explain, um, as I said, the cultural resources survey approach. Great, thanks, Natasha. And if you don't mind humoring me with continuing yeah, the advanced absolutely. slides, I'll give you I'll give you a heads up. So, similar to all the key planning elements that Natasha just referenced, the county staff and community started to establish an overall goal for the historic and cultural resources in the core study area, which you'll see over to the right. It just basically says maintain a unique sense of place and increase awareness of the corridor's rich history and culture through preservation of buildings and sites, public art, and interpretation of stories, events and people of historic significance. And then we also established eight values, call them values, Natasha, I'm sure you call them something else, concerning our approach to historic and cultural resources. And we summarized them here on the screen. Um, the first goal focuses on finding balance between countywide goals and the goals developed for Langston Boulevard. For, you know, for example, we have recommended full building preservation for a historic property. We will have to also consider other countywide goals if a property is being considered for redevelopment. 
Goals two, six, and eight focus on educating the public about these historic and cultural resources, um, and specifically states that we could do this through public art installation, interpretation, maybe it's doing something a bit more out of the box, like celebrating some of the many authors that we um, happen to have along Langston Boulevard. And then goals three and four focuses on encouraging and or achieving full preservation, partial preservation, or interpretation of significant historical and cultural resources to retain visible reminders of Arlington's culture and architectural heritage as the corridor experiences change. This could be done via specific implementation strategies, such as including transfer development rights, commercial renovation or improvement assistance, bonus density, and historic elements that protect the exterior. And lastly, goal five focuses on achieving community affordable units with full preservation and or partial preservation of existing multifamily housing noted as historic and cultural resources. So the next slide talks about um, throughout the duration of the Plan Lakes and Boulevard study, um, the Historic Preservation Program and planning staff and our county's consultants, we've been identifying and surveying historic and cultural resources. So all the way back in the beginning, four years ago, we identified about 120 properties or sites. And from that body information we received on those 120 properties, the county made a determination that 42 of those properties were the most significant and should receive preservation strategies. And those preservation strategies meant coming up with a criteria to determine which properties should get full building preservation, partial building preservation, on-site interpretation, nearby interpretation, or a combination of any of those recommendations. So listed on the screen are the eight criteria that um, historic preservation program staff reviewed and determined which preservation strategy is appropriate. And we did that for the 42 properties, however, that number has been reduced even further because about 10 of those properties were removed for consideration because they were not inside the core study area. And then nine were removed because they were located in East Falls Church in Terridale, which had their own policy documents. So again, the, these eight criteria helped us come up with this formula for recommendations, which include if a property was a local historic district or had an easement, if a property was a National Register property or in a National Register historic district, if it was determined eligible for the National Register, if a property was included in our research concerning garden apartments and complexes, if a property was in the historic resources inventory and was specifically ranked essential, important, or notable, if a property represented a unique architectural style, building type, or time period of architecture like Art Deco, if a property had majority of the seven aspects of integrity as defined by the National Park Service, and lastly, if a property conveyed a sense of place or was an informal landmark related to, say, legacy businesses and or African-American history. With the narrowing of the study area, that meant we came up with 23 preservation strategies, uh, 23 properties received preservation strategies, which were four properties for full building preservation, over five properties for partial preservation, over eight sites for on-site interpretation, and four sites for nearby interpretation. So the next three slides, if we go to slide 18, the next three slides identify those historic resources and the re recommended preservation strategies. For example, area two, which is here on the screen, involved 16 properties. And we recommended Moore's Barbershop to be fully preserved. And the partial preservation, we identified Garden City Shopping Center, Callaway United Methodist Church, and the Judge Thomas Monroe Law Office. The rest were either a form of site interpretation, nearby interpretation, or we didn't give them uh, any preservation strategy because they were not located in the core study area after we continue to reduce the area we wanted to focus on. So the next slide talks about area three and involves seven properties. And we recommended the Vale Apartments be fully preserved. And for partial preservation, we said the Lee Heights shops, Dominion Terrace condos, and the Woodley Arms apartments. And the rest of the properties are for site or nearby interpretation concerning either a legacy business like the Lebanese Taverna or the sites that involve the sit-ins. Then the next slide is about Area 5 West and East, and that involved 10 properties. And we recommended full preservation of the McLean Court apartments the Lion Village Apartments, and then partial preservation for the Park Georgetown Apartments. And then the other properties were recommended for site interpretation, such as the Lion Village Shopping Center, 
Fort Bennett and Fort Strong, which are Civil War sites, and the other properties were not in the war study area. So slide 21, Natasha and our communications team has been working closely with the public about these recommendations and concerning the approach to the historic and cultural resources. The public has wanted a better understanding of what these preservation strategies mean, and some of the property owners have requested to be removed from the preservation recommendations, such as Callaway United Methodist Church, which we recommended for partial preservation or site interpretation. The Lee Heights shop, shops, that is recommended for partial preservation, and the Lion Village Apartments, which we are recommending full preservation. We've responded to these concerns stating that although these are preservation strategies, there will be many factors that will need to be considered if a property is being proposed for redevelopment. And as we know, preservation in Arlington County does not live in a bubble, and we have more than often had to balance the many different county goals when it involves a redevelopment project, such as the environmental impacts, impacts to schools, if there's affordable housing being provided, are there important tree species being affected, can the roads handle the project, and so on. So the Historic Preservation Program, we do want to say we will continue to work with those property owners that are being recommended for a specific preservation strategy. And it is the goal of this program, especially with recommendations that we've identified in our draft Historic Cultural Resources Plan, soon to follow, um, to explore new tools that could support these preservation recommendations. So that concludes my part of the presentation. Natasha, is there anything else you wanted to give to the group? Nope, that's it. Okay. So um, we have one speaker for tonight. Um, we, I wasn't sure if they are here online with us. Uh, Mr. Williams? Thank you for joining us yes, tonight. Yes. You, I believe, have three minutes. Oh, I'm sorry, you get a full five minutes. So if you'd like to go ahead, you can begin. Great, thank you so much. My name is Zach Williams. I'm a land use attorney with the law firm of Venable. Um, and I just want to start off by saying um, thank you and to commend Natasha and all of staff and all the hard work on the Langston Boulevard planning process, um, as well as community leaders. This has been a very long process. A lot of hard work's gone into it and we're very supportive of the plan and look forward to it moving forward to adoption. Uh, with respect to uh, the topic tonight, um, historic preservation. Uh, we do represent the Lehigh Shops, uh, which is one of the properties that was uh, slated as potentially uh, being designated as partial for partial preservation, as was just noted uh, in the plan. Uh, and I just wanted to speak to that. There was already some mention that um, the owners did not agree with that. I just wanted to add a little bit of um, detail and maybe explanation for why. Um, the shops, most importantly, um, we don't believe are historic. Uh, according to assessment records, the buildings were built in the 1940s, and there's nothing in the plan that identifies any historic characteristics of the buildings, nor are we aware of any. Uh, in a letter to the board in response to the plan, the Waverly Hills Civic Association, which is uh, adjacent to the site, agreed that the shops while very beloved to the community, are not historic from any architectural perspective. Further, we believe that it's important to preserve flexibility in the plan for future development scenarios. The plan needs to remain nimble and able to adapt to future market conditions. Uh, many folks agree that the Lehigh shops and surrounding properties are and will remain a central commercial activity node on the corridor, uh, and the owner is uh, committed to that as well. However, historic preservation is not always the right tool and, and it's not the right tool here uh, to accomplish the goals of the plan in this area. Uh, there's other planning tools that we could use um, to accomplish those goals that would be a better fit and provide more flexibility. For these reasons, we urge that the historic preservation language in the plan be removed with respect to the Lehigh shops. Uh, that concludes my remarks. I uh, just want to say thank you again uh, to everyone working on the plan and thank you for considering uh, our remarks tonight. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Appreciate your comments. Um, before we kind of go over some things, I wanted to also, um, I circulated with you all just now, <laughs> letter that we received from our HLRB member, Dick Woodruff, 
Um, he could not be here tonight and he wanted to make sure that you saw the way that he has been communicating with myself and Natasha concerning some of the items that he wanted to bring up about um, the plan. And he provided a, sum a summary towards this letter uh, to us by email. So I'm just gonna kind of generalize it, but he wanted to make sure that the board was aware of the letter that he sent to Natasha last year, explaining his concerns about the possible impact about the two shopping centers, Garden City, uh, the Garden City Shopping Center and the Lehigh Shopping Center, and the possible shade impact of tall buildings on the Lion Village Shopping Center site on Maywood and the neighborhood's community park, Thrifton Hill Park. Um, regarding the Maywood shadow issue, he, Natasha provided staff as well as himself, the shadow studies that were conducted and um, which basically indicated that there was going to be a minimal impact on the Maywood homes, but he felt that it did not indicate the full impact to the park. And he believes that the plan should indicate that increased shadow there would be a consequence of the contemplated 12, 15 story building that is being proposed on site um, at the Lion Village Shopping Center. Um, and he just wanted to emphasize Maywood is a historic neighborhood and Thrifton um, Hill is it's primarily used by its residents. Um, also regarding the Garden City and the Lee Heights shopping centers, um, which are both being recommended for partial preservation. Um, at this time, the plan allows the building heights of the Garden City track of up to six stories and then up to two stories at Lee Heights and up to seven stories and up to 10 stories on what is currently the parking lot behind the shopping center. And he was concerned that there's no language at all referencing the history, the cultural importance, or, or the considerable current use of either the shopping center. He also was concerned the fact that there wasn't enough emphasis on the cultural impact of these places and how the community appreciates them. And he felt that that should be included more in the plan. Um, so he basically is suggesting that the HLRB requests that language be acknowledge both of the histories of the two shopping centers and the fact that they are vital to the Boulevard communities that they support today. And so a lot of what that information is in the letter that came um, to Natasha in December, in December 2022. Natasha, how are you envisioning that you would be taking you requesting input from the HLRB tonight on any of the items that were heard tonight? I mean, how have other commissions been providing you this information, providing their input to you? So a letter would be great. Um, we, like I said at the beginning of the presentation, we're planning to go to the PC um, RTA hearing in, in October. I believe it's October 2nd, but I'm not sure if it's October 2nd or October 4th. It's, it's either one of the two. Um, and then followed by uh, the week later, you know, with the county board RTA hearing. So if the board, if your board could provide comments in, in written form, you know, prior to that, that would be great. We're submitting our staff report on the, I believe it's going to be the 28th, which is just a few days prior to that meeting. Um, and so it would be great to have that input so that we can actually acknowledge it in the staff report. I mean, I am taking notes tonight and I'll put down what I heard, uh, but if you if you want to send something official that we can include with the staff report, we you know we'd be happy to do that. Great, thanks, Natasha. So, any of you want to provide any perspective of what you heard tonight, or any of you heard in the past? And I appreciate it. We can stick it, keep it to the historic resources. I have a question. Yes. When you're when you're designating things full preservation or partial, how? Um, how strong is that? So if something was designated full preservation, is it like the Columbia Pike form based code where we, we get to review or is it more of a, you know, a advisory document? That's a great question. And I um, want to kind of point out that when this is seen as a recommendation, not as a designation. Um, whenever I'm thinking of designation, I'm always concerned. I don't want the the public to think that there that once this plan gets hopefully approved by the county board in November that it's going to designate property as local historic districts but make a very good distinction we only get preservation treatments in form-based code as well as the clarinet sector plan that was 
received a, a kind of an updated option um, recently. So this will be a, a new approach that we're taking for a very large area in the county. And it really kind of sets the stage for what staff's recommendations are. It's 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 kind of like this is where we'd like to start and then we'll see how the conversation goes depending on what's being proposed and what are all the factors that are going to be considered for, let's say, a redevelopment project. So, for example, if we have a historic property where we've made a recommendation for full building preservation, but let's say it's in a part of uh, a, along the corridor where we desperately need to have affordable housing, that's going to be weighed in to figure out how do we balance the both and if can we even do that. And so it really kind of confirms that we will have a place at the table when we're having those discussions. It would also, I'm assuming Natasha, that it does also mean that the HLRB would be a part of a review, but it might again be similar to what we've seen tonight. There's not a motion, there's not an approval. It's more of they are part of the process for when things yeah, are being yeah. reviewed and are made public. And that's how the HLRB can provide its input. Um, and usually that tends to be uh, being a part of the review process through the site plan, um, the site plan review process, as well as letting the county board know what are the pros, what are the cons, do we support the project or, or are we concerned because, you know, we're seeing too many things um, taken away from the balance and maybe we feel historic preservation is not getting its fair share at the table. So it, it, it kind of starts the starts at a certain point and then we figure out what will work, but it always depends on the project. So is what's being recognized for pres potential preservation is the value that this commerce provides the community. Is that the aspect that gets preserved or is it the entire structure? Like if could you within the recommendation, is it just to provide that function to the community or the entire building? That's a really that's that's a good question. Good question. <laughs> and that's where you kind of get into wanting to leave that flexibility because if we're too if we're too focused on exactly what we need, mm -hmm. then that might prevent any change from happening and that might not be something we want. So we wanted to kind of leave it open so that the developer can kind of figure that out. But usually by that point, staff has also been involved in trying to figure out what could work. So if it's partial preservation, let's say, of um, uh, the Garden City Shopping Center, let's say it's let's say we're talking about that. Th that's a good question. If partial preservation is what that what, what we have for that recommendation, we'll figure out to see could we maybe do facade preservation, um, or is it trying to make sure that there is a, an affordable way that local businesses can utilize? Is that more of the importance, and that's something that we would have to talk about. That would also be the time when we would highlight the history of those sites. I know that um, Dick is wanting to have more suggestion to the history of some of these properties in the plan and I do appreciate that and I always love seeing history in it but it, typically in these documents we don't tend to do that we don't tend to give history write-ups of of all of the properties however I will also say there's been many different variations of this of plan lengths and boulevard study that there are previous reports that have history on some of these mm -hmm. and then but now that we're getting to the meat of what we need the county board to less that's, start, that's starting to kind of go away for this purpose. I just wonder if, please correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure, not sure. sure I completely understand. If at, I, I like the idea of having things flexible and letting the developer take it, but I also see that developer could take it any direction and a future board could take it any direction and use it as an ironclad way. It could be manipulated both ways, um, potentially. Um, so I just wonder if, helpful to articulate exactly what we value about each of these shopping, whether it's access for the local entrepreneurs, whether it's just having commerce in that space, whether it's even just the shape and size of them, uh, or if it's literal facade preservation. Um, I'm not exactly clear what it is in each of these, um, mm -hmm. because if it's not historic property, then it's kind of hard to argue for keeping bricks and mortar there. Um, but again, the contribution to the community is essential, and I grew up here and love these spaces, and I'm sure people want to 
make sure they're uh, available. No, those are those are really good points. I'm glad you brought that all up. And, and all of the properties that have the preservation strategies, they are they are all seen as historically significant. Mm -hmm. But but that is going to be something that the community, I would hope, during the site plan review process, would determine determine what those would be. Okay. And yes, I think it. That is, it is a good suggestion, though, um, to kind of emphasize what is the importance. But then again, let's say we don't see a redevelopment project for 10 years, and let's say, let's say all of the businesses are gone, and that's no longer like there's always that conundrum that we kind of see where you have things like you know a little Italy or 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 uh, Chinatown or, or or those types of things. We're, we're preserving, you know, that architectural history, but maybe we aren't able to save the prop the businesses so we have to kind of figure out I think per project what is important for that particular site so makes sense um I guess how I guess are there any sort of I guess are, are there any synergies or or, or even conflicts between the sort of the sort of preservation pl planning document we're going to review later and plan like like, like some boulevard are, are there any synergies or any Conflicts, or I mean, it may, it may have questions a little bit large. So you, can, you can answer here because that's out of curiosity. No, that's a that's they a good one too. Work together. Basically. They yeah. they're they're meant to work together, especially I look at the approach that we took for um, how we reviewed all of the historic and cultural resources. It's really what I hope to see we'll continue to do and get better at in the future, and that's really what we spell out in the historic cultural resources plan is to set make things a bit more um predictable um, as well as i feel like in the past preservationists when they would come in and say that building should be saved because it's it, because of its history and its architecture a lot of times the public still wants to understand why or how did you come to that or how is that building it seems very similar to that building why is that one okay to keep and this one isn't i think sometimes people feel that it can be a bit um uh you know, like it, it depends. It depends on, on who's recommending it and who's doing things. Subjective. Words are my strong point today. Um, and so this was our attempt to really kind of make it very clear. These are, this is the criteria that we chose. And I'm hoping that we'll continue to do that as we continue to look at, at different properties that we want to kind of spell out and look, and look at and, and understand more of. Because I, I think it can be challenging to explain to people your property is historic because of this. And I feel like this is um, our, our clearest approach to try and do that. And so I really see what we're seeing in Plan Lakes and Boulevard to be what we're going to see in the future. Um, and the plan that you'll be hearing about shortly focuses on that. It's 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 working together. Yeah, I thought the matrix was like pretty, pretty neat, actually. But it made it more clear. I mean. People can argue back and forth, but at least, at least there's a, a logic to sort of how things were other side and then you can not say, argue, argue about that, but at least there's yeah. a We tried to make it an objective methodology, yeah. given yeah. the different categories yeah. that we were assessing. So. Yeah, positive, yeah. Well, Natasha, I have your date, September 28th, and I can help with coming up together with summarizing how this discussion went so that can go into your staff report. That would be great. Yeah. If anybody else has anything that they'd like to point out, please, please let me know before September 28th and um, we can have a discussion to see yeah. if, we, if you all would like to have a letter to, I think because this is such a big sector plan and it's been going on for so long, I think it would be important for the HLRB to at least say a statement. Well, I have to say too, I think your recommendations are really you know, well thought out and them and stand by them so I would you know stick to you know what you did and, and stand up for um, the, the buildings that you um, pointed out and um, not you know let people take away from that because I think we should remind the property owners that this isn't you know putting a historic preservation overlay on your property um, you know I think this is more saying we value your property and um, you know, it shouldn't be that big of a surprise. I think they aren't big surprises. Yeah. Yeah. And um, 
and I'm glad that Mr. Williams um, was able to provide a public comment and Natasha and I will continue to have discussions to figure out how to respond to the public as they are presenting these concerns. Um, and as we all know, ultimately the county board would be the ones who would be adopting. So we've made our recommendations and, uh, and are working with Natasha to see if we can keep those recommendations as they are or if there are needed to be further tweaks. We will. I'll, keep you all posted, but it's still a work in progress, even though yeah, we're, yeah. Natasha, you're coming close to the end of it. Yeah. Well, thank you. Great. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you everyone. Bye bye. Bye, Ryan. Take care. <laughs> I need your concentration and attention just a little bit longer. No COAs tonight, but boy, they give you a lot to think about. So if you want to stand up and stretch, walk around the room, grab a snack, I'm not going to be offended. And I will try to get through this as quickly as possible. So as you'll recall, back in April, um, we first presented the initial draft of the Historic and Cultural Resources Plan to the commission along with our preservation consultant and we walked you through the different sections of the document we hit the highlights and you have you had questions and answers which which we addressed um, since that time we've completed a really robust public engagement period and we've analyzed the feedback that we received both from the public as well as internally and we have made revisions to the draft plan based on those comments and so a recommended draft was released uh, in August, in, in the middle of August of this year. And we are asking for your, tonight I'm, tonight I'm planning to give you a brief overview of what has happened to date, because I think a few of you were at our April meeting. I'll highlight just a few of the main changes that have uh, been made to the draft plan. And then at the end, we do want to ask for the HL, HLRB's formal support of the recommended draft. And as a reminder, the original plan, which is an element of the county's overall comprehensive plan, was approved by the county board in December of 2006. And so this planning process marks the very long and overdue first update to that plan. And before I dive into these details here, I just wanted to thank each of the members of my team, um, Lauren, Michael, and Serena, for all of their help getting us this far. This has been a multi-year process, as you can see by the timeline here on the screen, and it's been a very heavy lift for our team, but it's such an important process for us to have gone through because it really is going to guide us for the next decade. So with that, here's a quick summary of the planning process. On the left, you can see a lot of the milestones that we've already completed from the beginning of this process in 2020 all the way to where we are here in 2023. And we've been working a lot, as I said, this year on the public engagement aspect of the plan. Um, we, in addition to coming to the HLRB, we've been to the Long Range Planning Committee of the Planning Commission twice, both in the spring and just a few weeks ago. We've hosted 15 different pop-up events across the county, one community open house. We've had digital materials online, including a story map, some really cool cultural heritage videos, as, as well as online feedback opportunities. So we've received a lot of public comment, um, and I hope that by now <laughs> you're all pretty familiar with what is in the plan. And in terms of what's to come, so again, hoping to get the HLRB's official blessing this evening, and then just like the project you heard for Plan Langston Boulevard, we are also on the exact same timeline of trying to do a request to advertise to both the Planning Commission and County Board in October and then adoption in November. And in addition to all of that, we're also working behind the scenes on an implementation framework, which is going to show how we are going to implement the plan, both in the short term and the long term. And that will guide us as we do our work. So this next graphic is just a, a fancy summary uh, showing you from where we started in the spring of 2020, a lot of the different engagement and different um, 
communication tools that we have used to solicit public feedback and to share this information with the public. And so where we are now is on the far, far right of the slide in the, in the yam colored box. And we are nearing that, that finish line of um, the, the formal public hearings and the formal adoption. So as a quick refresher for those of you who weren't here for the original session back in, in April, there are five main focus areas that are in the draft plan, and these remain unchanged from the initial April draft, by the way. So the main goals and objectives are centered on building an inclusive understanding and support for Arlington's history, people, and places through community engagement, encouraging financial and other benefits of preservation through incentives, integrating historic preservation with other county policies and priorities, as well as addressing the importance of cultural landscapes through expanding our partnerships, improving regulation processes, such as creating new tools and preserving new types of resources, as well as establishing an archeology span program for the county. And lastly, expanding and improving both the historic resources inventory or the HRI and other preservation-based technology and information systems that we use. The forward thinking actions and goals that are presented in the plan will allow our program to advocate for more meaningful preservation through increasing our partnerships, as well as by offering more flexibility and incentives into our standard preservation tools. We are also proud that the plan provides recommendations to preserve and interpret an inclusive collection of histories and resources for future generations. We developed equity aspirations for each of the goals of the plan to describe how these achievements could advance inclusion, diversity, equity, and or accessibility. Next slide. So between April and June, as I said, we requested community feedback on the initial April draft, and we spent the spring and summer analyzing that feedback and making some minor revisions to the draft. These changes are re reflected in the, what we're calling recommended draft that was released in mid-August. And so this is just a quick summary of what is different between the two versions. Uh, we added locations of historic resources and neighborhood reference points throughout the plan. This was a, a, a helpful rec recommendation from the Long Range Planning Committee, in fact, and we agreed that adding this additional information would further educate readers about historic places all throughout the county. We also strengthened the connection between the historic built environment and the natural environment by adding several references to the county's different biophilic initiatives. We likewise made several clarifications throughout the plan, including providing additional context to certain sections of the statement of historical and cultural significance. We recognize county transportation projects as a partnership opportunity in the future. We explained the size of the proposed neighborhood heritage district within the regulation goal and we also updated some section titles in the plan. We also clarified some terminology, particularly the term character and how that was used and defined. And we defined it more in a preservation lens of historic character, architectural character, and character defining features, as opposed to the more uh, general uh, reference to neighborhood character. We also added a disclaimer statement in the full historic resources inventory table that's at the back of the plan that states that the table contains the raw current data as the county board had approved it back in 2011. We did not change any street names. We did not indicate which buildings have since been demolished, which ones have since been protected, because we wanted to reinforce the need why an update to the HRI is so important so we can get that information current. And we also opted against adding more maps and historic content into the plan because we felt this could have resulted in just too much detailed information in a plan that really is intended to be aspirational. Um, and so we do reference having more maps and historic content available for the public in several of our plan goals. And something we're very excited about is the graphic in the upper right corner of this slide. We updated the icon in our segment of the comprehensive plans wheel if you remember before, it originally was a tablet icon that either looked like a marker or a gravestone, depending on <laughs> what you thought it looked like. Um, and so we decided to update it, give it a fresh new look uh, to have it better reflect the broader work that our program does. 
So it does reference architecture, those are like the cluster of buildings at the top. It also references, it's like, it's a little hard to see from here, but it's like a vessel to represent archeology span as well as a historic marker to represent interpretation. So in conclusion, there's just a few reminders and next steps to remind you. And if you haven't already, please read the plan, sit with it. Um, there's, there's a lot in there. There's, there's a lot of, I think, creative solutions to consider. We also have a, an online comment form that is available online until October 1st. And these are for comments from the public that will be sent directly to the county board for them to consider um, as part of their deliberation. And there will be several opportunities for the HLRB to continue to stay involved. We would like to request at least two HLRB volunteers to attend the planning commission and county board hearings with us this fall. And at each meeting, the HLRB will allow to make remarks. So um, we would appreciate the support on that. And then lastly, you know, we're here to answer any questions or comments you have. I know the hour is getting a little bit late, um, but we would like to request that this evening that the HLRB make a formal motion um, in support of the recommended draft, as well as submitting an official letter that we could then submit as part of our county board report package that both the Planning Commission and the County Board will review. So with that, we are happy to address questions, comments, concerns. Well, I love that the plan has incentives uh, or it's recommending incentives for preservation, um, financial, you know, density bonuses, um, maybe streamlining of uh, permitting. Um, I think that's kind of the next step that I would love to see. I also love that there um, is a mention of pursuing demolition review um, at the state level, um, because that would be a big next step for preservation in the county. Um, so thank you for including those. That's a good aspirational plan. Impressive body of work. You guys have done a great job. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe November we'll do that. <laughs> yeah. uh, completely echo what everybody else has been saying about the level of work that's gone into this and just the level of effort. So thank you guys so much for all the resources and time you've put into this. It's a wonderful document. Thanks, John. What are the updates in terms of the biophilia connection sort of with the county sort of goals, goals on that? I haven't read that, which should be honest. Yeah. So we have it in a few places. There's a reference, I believe, in the introduction section that talks about there was a biophilic initiative that the county, um, a resolution rather, mm -hmm. that the county adopted, I believe it was in 2019. Does yeah, that sound right? It's relatively recent. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, highlighting the connection between the built environment and the green space that the county has, how um, they complement one another. So where we could and where it seemed appropriate, where, we, where we're already mentioning landscapes, we, we tried to make that connection stronger in the plan. That's great. Great. Great point to sort of, sort of connect the landscape and sort of the views to, to the sort of resources. So it's a positive update. Any other questions to try to answer? Do we know what when what is the planning commission meeting? Do we have the, the dates yet? Or we, if they're not confirmed, um, most likely it will be either October 2nd or October 4th, which is DRC night. So we should find out in the next week okay. which which agenda will be on. Um, so to go to bring the request to advertise to the planning commission, we will give a similar presentation mm -hmm. like this evening and answer commissioners' questions. There will be an opportunity for someone from the HLRB to make a statement mm -hmm. on behalf of the commission. Um, so if I think it would be important to have a spokesperson for that meeting, and then for the county board meeting, I 
it's either the I don't have my sheet. I think it's either it. October thirtieth or um, the RTA with the Ken Board. It's either October fourteenth or the seventeenth. Oh, right, right. So the fourteenth is a Saturday. The seventeenth is the Tuesday. And we have not gotten confirmation yet if we'll be on the consent agenda or the regular agenda for the request to advertise. If we are on the consent agenda, none of us need to go. <laughs> if it's on the regular agenda, then we will make a presentation formally. And at that time, it would be helpful to have an HLRB spokesperson. So we can definitely keep you, Mr. Chair, in, um, informed of the dates as they're confirmed for us. And then maybe if you wanted to reach out to members via email mm -hmm. to try to get willing volunteers on their states, you can coordinate that. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? I know it's been a long night, but. <laughs> We make a motion to approve. Yeah, that's a note. Yeah, motion. Yeah. All right. So, I move that the HLRB recommend approval of the updated historic and cultural resources plan recommended draft as submitted. Second. Third. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Third, fourth, and fifth. Exactly. Please fill in the roll. All right. So. Mr. Aiken. Yes. Mr. Davis. Yes. Ms. Foster. Yes. Ms. Meyer. Yes. Ms. Myers. Yes. Mr. Wenchel. Yes. I'll we'll take it. You <laughs> <laughs> have a screen. Yes. All right, so I think very, very last we had time for chairman's report and staff report we do not have anything else to share yeah i don't know if you had anything else you wanted to share the chair's report i'll, I'll, I'll i mean just to we this we definitely need we definitely do need support you know sort of hp staff and, and also more importantly the plan itself as it goes before the plan convention and the board so i'll be reaching out to people to to, 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 to offer support at, at, at the meeting so that's that's my only with anything off the night otherwise it's pretty late so yeah <laughs> <laughs> and we can also help if anybody wants to do it, but isn't sure exactly what to say. We can also kind of assist with giving a summary and if there's certain areas that you prefer to highlight, we can we can work with you all as well. And Serena sent around, I believe earlier this week, uh, a message to all of the commissioners that included some of the web links. So if you mm -hmm. wanted to look at the project page, if you wanted to watch the video recording, which is like all of five minutes that walks you through the basic overview, if you wanted to watch any of the videos, there's like a one page flyer about the plan. There's there's lots of materials available on the website. So feel free to, to use those and share those if you think there are others in your circle circles who would want to come out to support the plan or might be interested in what the plan is trying to accomplish. So okay, well with that adjourned. All right. Everybody. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Good night, John. Good night. 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 Good night.